ladies and gentlemen, recorded in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. It's time for Bite Night Picks with your host, Frank and Matt Allen. And just like that, we're back with Fight Night Picks UFC 282 coming up this weekend. Jan Blahovich taking on Magomed Ankalaev in the main event on November 23rd. That was announced that that would be your main event. And so on two and a half weeks notice, both of these fighters who were scheduled for a three-round fight are upgraded to that five-round main event. So grateful that you could join us coming up this week. As always, Craig Allen. You can find me on Twitter Instagram, Craig Allen, FNP. With me to my left, to your right, as always, respective socials, Matt Allen, Matt Allen, FNP. Now, when we do look at this card, it is a little bit of a strange one. Your co-main event, unranked lightweights, you have the force that is Patty the Batty Pimblet taking on Jared Flash Gordon. And we go up and down through the list of contenders and fighters on the card. Former champ in the man himself, Robbie Lawler, taking on Santiago Ponzinibbio. Former title challenger, Darren Till, taking on former... KSW and EFC double champ, Drikas Duplessis. And a lot of rookies on this card making their debuts. A lot for the fans to really like. And a loaded prelim card as well. It should be a really deep card too. And that's the fun thing about this prelim. I know we do have a lot of rookies making their first fights on this card. But still, guys like Chris Curtis and Joaquin Buckley are buried deep on the prelims. And I think that does speak to the overall depth of the card. I know it is a little unfortunate that the title fight that we were promised, Yuri Prohoshka of course getting, and I quote Dana White, the worst shoulder injury I have ever seen, is too bad. Because you know he's going to be on the shelf for a really long time. Was he in the room when it happened? I don't know. Dana White, the man who knows all. But for Yuri, it just is too bad that we're not going to be able to see him compete for so long because everybody loves watching a Yuri Prohoshka fight. They are always absolutely insane. It's too bad for Glover, too, because if you're an MMA fan, you're a Glover to share a fan. Like, I don't know if you saw that interview he did where he was talking about Alex Pereira and how good of friends they are, but he's like, Glover just seems like you or me. He's like, I don't do much with my friends. I just like having people over to talk shit. Well, but Alex loves watching his I- fight over and over again. Like, it's too bad that Glover isn't getting the opportunity to fight for a UFC title. I sent a snap to my buddies when I was doing the, the tape study for this card because I was on Glover to share his Instagram and he's in the tub in his backyard watching a crow eat in a tree. You know. And I watched it. But regardless, when we do look at this card, again, it is loaded with a lot of prospects. You're going to have a look back at our Dana White's Contender Series previews for some of these fighters. But of note, you have Cameron Simon, Antonio Tricoli, Venetia Salvador, and of course, Eric Silva. But not that Eric Silva. No. Making their debuts off Dana White's Contender Series. Another short notice debut for... The most interestingly nicknamed fighter I've ever seen in Steven Kozlow. An absolute menace on the mat. It's going to be a big time card. We're going to throw it on over to our fight of the night screen. Make sure you comment below with who you have in the fight of the night. 14 fights tentatively scheduled here on Sunday as we throw this video out to you. So again, comment with your fight of the night. We'll throw it on over to the fight of the night screen. Let us know down below in the comment section who you've got. It's time for the fight of the night with Fight Night Picks. So for Santiago Ponzinibbio, his last two times out, both losses, both by split decision, and both possibly fight of the night. Now, he did get a bonus when he took on Michelle Pereira his last time out, but his fight against Jeff Neal was absolutely bonkers. And since Ponzinibbio has come back off of those life-altering medical issues that he did have, he is 1-3, and three, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. And for Robbie Lawler, he had a wild fight of the night type fight his last time out against Brian Barbarina. And you might be sour on that just because of how Barbarina lost to Dos Anjos just last weekend. Tough stylistic matchup. Though. But style for style. Both of these guys tend to strike. Lawler from Iowa. He has that wrestling pedigree in his back pocket, but he doesn't really like to use it. And for Ponzinibbio, his last two fights, he's attempted takedowns and gotten takedowns in the second round against both those guys, Neil and Pereira. But I expect these two guys to strike, and I'm really looking forward to this one. This is a fun fight, and it's kind of wild to think about because they could have fought five years ago when they were both still in the top ten of this division, and that would have been like a main event caliber fight or like a pay-per-view co-main event caliber of fight. That's how good these two guys were when they were in their primes. And I know we are looking at a Robbie Lawler and a Ponzinibbio who aren't necessarily in the prime of their careers anymore, but they still make for entertaining fights no matter who they're matched up against. 
Robertson. Yes, Ponzinibbio at this stage of his career, is he still as explosive as a striker? Well, no, not necessarily. The same thing has to be said for Robbie Lawler. But they're both willing to eat a big shot to give their own big shot. And I think when both guys have that kind of a mentality, they're going to make for a phenomenal fight. Now, if you want a real low-key pick, Dan Daniel, Daniel De Silva, Venetia Salvador, they throw out offense and defense, just goes completely out the window. So watch out for that fight. But a couple of very seasoned middleweights on this card. Chris Curtis staying on Joaquin Buckley for Buckley. He just knows big explosive movements moving forward. And for Chris Curtis, you might be, again, sour on him based on his last performance against Jack Hermanson. But look at the damage he was able to dole out coming into the UFC. Phil Haas, Brennan Allen, and the like. I mean, for Curtis... He was a 2021 fighter of the year. His 2022 started off great, except for that blip his last time out. But I expect both of these guys to really have a big performance. Curtis is ranked 14th in the division with Joaquin Buckley on the outside looking in, coming off his loss to Nasruddin Imovov. He needs a big statement win, so both these guys need to pick up the pieces, and I'm really eager to see this one. Even with Curtis being the only ranked fighter in this matchup, I think this is a very close fight and a really well-matched fight because for Joaquin Buckley, we realize just how big and explosive of a, of a striker he is at this weight division. He does kind of have that Mike Tyson style to him. He's got a big shell. He likes to duck, explode with big shots. And when he lands those big shots, not many people can stand up to them. And of course, everyone's going to remember, he might have the greatest knockout in UFC history. That's not an exaggeration. He did something that we haven't seen before and we haven't seen since. And... A guy who has, anyways, Joaquin Buckley's insane though. So for Chris Curtis, I think this is going to bring out the best of him. I know with a guy like Jack Hermanson, Curtis had to be worried about the takedown attempt. And even though we have seen him look really good against some primary grapplers, Hermanson was a step above some of those other guys. So I think this is a great reset for Chris Curtis. And the fun thing about this fight too is, it feels like a fight where if you win, you're going to get something big next up. I, it might not be a guy in the top five, in the top 10 necessarily, but with this being a pretty important fight, we're being honest, in the pay-per-view portion of the card. I think the winner of this is going to get a big fight the next time Big out. time opportunity for all four of these competitors. Again, 14 total fights on this card. Let us know down below who you have in the fight of the night. So before the rankings drop after UFC Orlando, Thompson versus Holland, tentatively right now as of Sunday, you have nine ranked fighters on this card. Blahovich and Kalayev up at the top. You also have Darren Tildrikas, Duplessis, Bryce Mitchell, Ilya Topuria. You have Jarzino Rosenstrike, Chris Dawkins, and Chris Curtis all ranked, as we mentioned, a lot of debuting fighters. The debut of now 18-year-old Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Jay Perrin. Have they trained before at Syndicate MMA? Yeah, a little bit. We're going to talk about that one as it comes up. But a lot of fights to really look forward to. Some with low divisional importance. The featherweight debut of Alexander Hernandez. It's going to be a after wild fight. 18 fights above this weight class. Taking on Billy Quarantillo, who had a burn burners last time out against Shane Burgos. Matt... I've talked a mile a minute. If people can't tell, I'm very excited about this card, and we have a lot to talk about. We really do. There's a ton of really fun fights. We haven't even talked about the fight. Like, Bryce Mitchell versus Ilya Tapuria is kind of one of those as high-tier prospect versus prospect fights as you could possibly have. Like, somebody's O has to go, and normally you only talk about that when fighters are champions fighting the number one contender. These guys are barely even ranked. That's how good the weight class is, so I think this is a really fun card. Should be a great card. Make sure you comment below with your picks throughout the week. You can find us at Fight Night Picks on on Instagram and Twitter for more. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. Coming up this weekend, rookie square off at Bantamweight. As we have South Africa's own most savage player. It's Cameron Simon taking on Obi-Wan Shinobi, the pillow, Stephen Coslow, maybe one of the most interesting nicknames I've ever heard in my entire life. And when you look at this one, on November 30th, it was announced that Coslow was going to be stepping in on very short notice to replace one Ronnie Lawrence in this matchup. And I think that says a lot, not just about Coslow, but for Simon. Yeah. Kind of the ceiling that they're projecting for this very young prospect. Of course, when he was signed off Dana White's Contender Series this past summer, he was, at the time, the youngest male fighter on the UFC's roster. Now... Raul Rosas Jr. came after him, but for Simon, he had a very impressive showing on Dana White's Contender Series. We talked all about Simon this past summer before that fight, so we're going to throw it on back to our Dana White's Contender Series preview to give you a bit of a look at Cameron Simon, what you can expect in this matchup, and what we thought of his fight on Contender Series. Taking on the EFC and also former, and I want to throw it out there, fight star amateur champion Cameron Simon. 
if you look at it for him, very, very good with his wrestling, with his grappling. Obviously, we've seen EFC talent merge over into the UFC, have success. We saw it with a guy like Drikus Duplessy, former champ, higher weight classes. I mean, I can think of another fighter. Don't who... say JP base because it did not go well for him at all. Yeah, JP, it didn't go as well. But former EFC champ there too. Matt, when we put these two guys together, obviously, if you look at it for uh, Wang Kim and for Saman, not really the greatest level of competition for either guy. I mean, 19 and 29, the combined opponent record for Wang Kim, 16 and 18 for Saman, if you look at it that way. But they've been winning fights the way that you want to see them winning these fights. So what do you make of this match? Because I think this one's actually really tough. It's kind of the weird thing about this fight. For Saman, I, I might project a higher ceiling for him, but it is a little weird that they do have the same level of experience. Although one's only 21 years of age and the other fighter is almost 30. Like, I do agree with you 100% with what you have brought up. Now the guy does have the greatest level of competition on their way up into the UFC. And this fight kind of reminds me, like, I don't know if you had any friends who like drew a lot growing up, but you know those like really complicated diagrams where it shows you how to draw really nice things and it like starts out with a stick man with like the triangles and the circles and nothing, you can't really make sense of anything. Both these fighters are like the first step of that drawing. Like they still have to be developed. They're still going to need a lot of fights. And I got to be honest, even if Josh Wang Kim is able to win, even with him being almost 30 years of age, it would be nice if he had a couple more fights because I do like a lot of the well-roundedness from his game. He's someone who I do like on the ground because he is so slick. He moves very well. He has very active hips on the ground as well. He does have decent striking, but I feel like he could almost be thrown into a category with like a Ricky Tercios where it's like, hey, you're really good at all this stuff, but you're not good enough at any single one area to really carry you over the hump. So I think this fight's going to be a very entertaining one, but I think this might be a weird fight where it's almost a disservice for the winner to get signed by the UFC, if that makes any sense. So for Cameron Simon, he earned that win week five of Contender Series this past summer, took on one half of the Flying Wang Kim brothers, and in the first round withstood a little bit of adversity. In the second round, he was really starting to kind of rally through, and he looked great in that fight, and he was really able to show up and show out in that matchup. What did you make of Simon in that fight? He's a lot more, he fights like a guy who has a lot more fights than he does. And that's really impressive to see from a kid who's only 21 years old. And I, I say kid to sound like Dana White because it's very rare that I'm older than a UFC fighter by a serious amount. And for Samon, it is interesting because we do see this, maybe not all that often, but we'll get a fighter like this maybe twice a year. Where you have a fighter kind of around that 20 years old, Raul Rojas Jr., like you had mentioned, is another guy that we're going to mention who's in the same category. And it really does feel like they have a sink or swim opportunity. And we kind of know everything we're going to know about them based off their first performance. But what I will say about Samon compared to a guy like uh, Chase Hooper, for instance, was Hooper, you always know, needed to get the fight to the mat for him to have a lot of success. You saw that in his first fight against the younger, smaller Tamor. And he got rocked early, got it to the mat, though. And then we saw where his skill set really excelled. Samon is also a very good grappler. He has a lot of wins by submission. But I do feel like his game is a lot more fleshed out than a guy like Chase Hooper. Well, and if you watch the kind of handing out of the contracts, the part where Dana White takes over, this was his quotable after the fight it was the composure at 21 years old if he doesn't have a chance yet uh or sorry if he doesn't have a nickname yet he should call himself the future that was where dana white was headed with it but for simon the thing that i really like out of him he started kickboxing at the age of 12 he joined team cit his big mentor in all of this game is well south africa's own who's also fighting on this card who's also from the same gym drikas duplessy very close with him and a great blueprint to follow and for exactly. simon former big timer over with efc just like duplessy was but for simon what you see is a guy that got into MMA so young that he can mix his martial arts. And he's one of those guys that flows between two stances, which you love to see. We talk about it quite a bit, like Mateusz Nikolaou. He can flow southpaw to orthodox and throw power shots and mix them in well. You saw that last weekend against Matt Schnell. Jorge Masvidal is one of those guys that can kind of play off of both stances to throw some of his power shots. Simon can do the same thing, and he throws really, really good leg kicks. He has nice takedowns to his repertoire. One of the things that I'm a little hesitant hesitant on is he does get hit clean quite a bit in most of his fights he could hit clean against Wang Kim in that round and you saw that again in the first round where he was accepting a lot of the body shots in the second round he started to bring that right hand down and he blocked it a little bit more and he 
does seem to have good in-fight adjustments for a guy that's so young as well. He does, and that is a nice thing to see, but you're right. It is, and we see this a lot, young MMA fighters, fighters who are adding new elements to their game. You learn the offense, and then the defense will come. And the good thing about being only 21 years old, I guess he's almost 22 now, he is going to get quite a bit better every single time we see him out there. But Steven Kozlo is going to be a really interesting case, because we haven't, A, really talked about him all that much. You mentioned the takedown attempts that Samon can go for. Cameron is a fairly good offensive wrestler, but I don't know if this is the guy you want to be going for a lot of takedowns against because Steven Coslo, I don't know what a whirling dervish is, but on the mat, that is the best way to describe him. He's someone who is very active, not only off his back, but in the top position too. And I love the way that he threatens with submissions to then pass and get into more dominant positions. He's a really interesting fighter. And that's why this fight is almost a disservice to both guys. Uh, we looked at the odds right before we started filming and Simon is a bit of a favorite, which I am a little bit surprised to see because I think these are two prospects. And of course it depends on how they develop and what elements they add to their game. But I don't think Coslo is going to be a guy who's going to be around for a little while in the division. I don't think this will be a one-and-done kind of fight. No, and I think it's just because of the short-notice nature for Kozlo, yeah. but to get ready for this fight, I watched a lot of the tape on him. Combat Night Pro is where he spent all of his pro career, and over there... You look at the opponents that he's taken on, and he's beating guys that he should beat. Combined opponents' record out of those wins is 13 and 22, but they're all first-round submissions. And you might look at him, and you go over to his Instagram, and you see where he trains. Now, I, I put Elevate MMA, which is Preston Parsons, Jim, who's in the UFC, but he really does credit a guy whose name you heard a lot last weekend and Julian Williams over at Fusion XL. That's who Philip Rowe credited with his win over Nico Price. So for Kozlo, spent a lot of time there training with Lucas Alexander, and I listened to a Kozlo interview that he did with MMA Sucka and James Lynch, and he said this was actually the third short notice opportunity the UFC has given him this year, so that really kind of pinged my radar. Really, exactly. He was booked in first against Mario Bautista, but he had to cut a lot of weight. A then he was booked in against Christian Rodriguez not that long ago, but he, he was making the weight. And then they said, no, sorry, we gave it to Joshua Weems. So ultimately, he gets Simon. But Kozlo is somebody that's been on the UFC's radar for a while. And he's been getting ready for this one. So then James kind of peppered him and asked him about his background. He said he started with karate at the age of 15. Took, or sorry, started even earlier with karate. Then at the age of 15, took up MMA. When he was in high school, he had the opportunity to train a lot. And that's what got him to the dance. And you see him competing a lot in no-gi jiu-jitsu tournaments. You watch the way that he fights. The one thing that I don't love is he goes across the cage with his arms out to get a lot of his takedowns but his takedowns are usually quite efficient his grappling again offensively and defensively is great and the other thing that's going to be underrated about his game because he's 6-0 and with six first round submissions his striking from both stances is really unorthodox and I think it poses a big problem for a lot of his opponents it might for a lot of his opponents but I do think and I don't want to use the term sloppiness I'll agree with you unorthodox but that is the thing about Kozlo he doesn't throw traditional strikes in the way that you think think about Darren Elkins from last weekend Darren Elkins might be one of the toughest men to ever walk the face of the planet. Shout out to Darren Elkins. But you know that like looping overhand right that he was throwing to uh, Jonathan Pierce? It would land every now and then. It's a tough strike to gauge because it is thrown from weird angle, but it's not the most effective. And that's the thing that I do worry about with Kozlo in this matchup. I know Cameron is uh, susceptible to getting hit by some of the bigger shots, but I do think those looping shots of Kozlo are going to get him to get countered a few times because I do think Samon does have better footwork and I think that's what's going to help him in this matchup. I think if he is able to gauge his range, which is going to be difficult, because I will say this, both guys are big for the division. I don't think either guy is going to be small when they get matched up against other fighters in the future. I know Kozlo is matched up at only 5'7", but he's not a small guy at 5'7". No. So uh, again, I think Simon, I just like his range management a little bit more in this, but I can see Kozlo going out there, getting an early takedown, and if that is the case, even if he doesn't get the submission in the first round, how many times do we see it? A primary grappler, even though he can strike, gets a takedown on a striker early, and then that striker becomes a lot less confident in their own abilities. They start throwing less punches, they start worrying more about the takedown. I think this is a really fun fight to open up the whole card. If you look at it again from that interview, this was my big takeaway. So James asked Kozlo what he's done for work. He says, I worked in construction and sold weed for a long time. And then he got out of that and he's wow. got all of his eggs in this basket training for MMA and specifically for this fight. And he's been on the UFC's radar for some time. A guy who didn't need contender series with just six pro wins. So if we have a look at the odds, Simon open at a minus 150, minus 270 right now. Kozlo open plus 135, plus 215. We have a look at the topology votes. Surprise to us as they are to you. Simon feels like a Francis Marshall type prospect, so I'm going to say over under 72.5% Simon. I'll say over. I'm going to say over. 
And it is over. It's quite a bit over. 352 votes, though, because this one is on short notice. 82% Simon, 26% by decision, 69% by knockout for the 18% that have Kozlo, 54% by submission. So, Matt, do you have the younger of the two young guns in this one? I do, but I think I've thrown up enough red flags and hopefully I've given Kozlo enough flowers to say that he is a very legitimate threat to Simon. Him. I think you're right. Like, Simon's a guy who, moving forward, I think the UFC is probably going to start investing in him. He is very young. If he does get this win, Win, it's probably not going to give him the credit that he probably should deserve based on the uh, level of opposition but you're right based on the short notice nature of the fight I think that will be difficult for Kozlo if this fight does go late he is very used to those first round stoppages too so it will be interesting to see how the cardio holds up as it does go late and only on a week's notice too it might be difficult so I've got Cameron in the matchup but I think these are two fighters who are going to be seeing a lot of Kozlo is getting ready for a UFC fight it just took the time to get the call and he said himself in the interview that he turned down fr uh, FRM and chose Iridium, so interesting that a guy's like, nah, I didn't want them representing me. I like Jason House, but I like that out of Kozlo, the names that they matched him up with. I really do like that. Again, I think him getting ready to cut the weight, I'm not so worried that it is on short notice. And I think a fight like this actually does help him out. So I'm going to go with the big underdog in this one in Kozlo. I like the shots that he's able to go out there with. But for Simon, again, when you watch him fight, the leg kicks, the overhand right, and the left hook that he was able to hit. Josh Wang Kim with his last time out. He did look amazing. Should be a great fight. Very long video on this one because we're excited about these two prospects. A lot of prospects on this card. You're going to want to keep it locked in with Fight and Apex. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Coming up this weekend, an all-Brazilian pairing. Coming up, we have Shoot the Box, Diego Lima's own, Miojo, Daniel Lacerda da Silva taking on... Academy of Hibas' Vinicius Salvador, the nickname's Phenomeno, and he looked like a Phenomeno on Dana White's Contender Series this past summer. We talked a lot about Vinicius Salvador there on our preview show, so we're going to throw it back to that preview, get you up to speed on Salvador and how he matches up in this fight with Daniel De Silva. The next fight, the co-main event, Shannon Ross. Uh, listen, this is the one where I went down through it. He's 13 of 5. He's 33 years old at flyweight, where you're usually on your way out the mm. door at that point. He hasn't competed at 125 pounds since 2018 and it's a little bit of a head scratcher of a fight he's taking on brazil's venetia salvador you go down through it he was 12 and 4 before he beat a debuting fighter back uh, not that long ago so beating a debuting fighter at 12 and 4 gets you an opportunity on dana white's contender series and for venetia salvador he's beating guys he should beat his record's padded he's lost the guys that are all right exactly but, like i look at this one as how far off the hill has Shannon Ross fallen? And for Venetia Salvador, can you pull one out of the hat? Like, that's pretty much how I look at that fight. That is the wild thing about Salvador and his record. He beats guys who have negative records or records that are around 500. And all of his losses are to anybody who has any good levels of experience under their belt. So this feels like one of those trapdoor fights no matter what. Because I do agree with you. Shannon Ross has some nice skills, don't get me wrong. But he is at the age and sort of at the point of his career where you do start to worry about how well he can fight at 125 pounds. With Venetius, it's more eye catching. Don't get or don't get me wrong, but that's the problem with his whole style. It's that if it looks good, it's gonna look great. If it looks bad, it's gonna look really bad. If he loses to Shannon Ross on this show, like I don't really know where his future belongs at all. Because again, if you just keep on losing anytime you fight people who have good records, but you can beat people who are making their debuts or who are that like two and three type fighters, then I'm very concerned about your overall ceiling. Yeah, I mean for Venetius Salvador, spending time with such promotions as like the SFTs of the world, the jungle fights. I mean, fought with Max Fight, Pentagon Combat, uh, Arena Global. Shudo Brazil. Like, yeah, Shudo Brazil. So every now and again, you get a diamond in the rough there, but it really is a tough one. So Venetia Salvador goes out there and fights Shannon Ross on Dana White's Contender Series and knocks him down three times in that fight. And for some fucking reason, Dana White gave Shannon Ross a contract Don't and he's going to have him on the UFC Perth card, the, the pay-per-view, the Volkanovski Makachev card. I don't understand why either because Salvador just went out there and landed everything he wanted, which is really weird because he has such odd angles. He looked like a world beater in that fight, though. Like, if that's the only fight you've ever seen him be in, you think he could match up with Alex Pereira tomorrow and probably take him on. But 
He is what he is, and I think that's a fair thing to say about Venetia Salvador. He is an extremely exciting fighter, and I don't think that's ever going to change. But the problem is, with a lot of guys like that, it's really difficult to figure out where their ceiling is, because there's kind of those exciting level of fighters at every stage of the way along your path to a UFC title. There's guys that are in that kind of technical brawling category, who can make it to the top five and even become champions in some cases. Then there's a lot of brawlers, though, for being honest, who are just sort of lifelong, borderline ranked fighters. And for Salvador, it would be interesting to see if he can ever kind of buck the trend. Yeah, I mean, you look at both these guys 14 wins for Salvador 11 for Daniel De Silva all of them all 25 are by finish between both of these guys but for Salvador we talked about this on the channel before stepdad used to have a poster with Brian McCabe on it that said the best offense did. is a good defense and for Venetia Salvador it's the opposite the best defense is a good offense and he doesn't have striking defense at all I love watching it though at all and I wrote down as I was watching his fights Hey, he kind of fights like a flyweight Alex Oliveira, which is weird because Daniel De Silva trained for the longest time at ATS Tres Rios, which is the Alex Oliveira gym, and that was his main guy, a guy who had cornered him in the past. For De Silva, the big difference is he does hold his hands up quite a bit more, but he does throw a lot more in terms of spinning attacks. He throws spinning wheel kicks, he throws spinning back fists and the like, and if you look at his fights in the UFC, you might be incredibly down on Daniel De Silva because he's fought three times in the UFC. He's lost three times, and he's been finished, Matt, how many times? Three times! It's been tough. Third time's the charm, but you go back and you watch his fights. He had a little bit of success against Jeff Molina, was able to get the back until he didn't. He had good success, looked great against Francisco Figueredo, the, the, the worst of the Figueredos, until he gets the takedown and then that zippy knee bar. And then if you watch his fight against old, old Victor Altamirano, the former LFA great, Goes out there, drops him really quick, and then out of it, he ends up getting down to the mat, and then he can't really get himself up out of a position where you would have thought, hey, you just push off the hips and get out. He just kind of sits there and accepts the ground and pound and loses. That's been my issue with Daniel De Silva. Not that he can't have success in different ranges of MMA or in different categories of it. It's just how sustainable is that level of success? Because he can go out there and look really good early, get a knockdown, like you had mentioned, get some takedowns. But the problem is... How much energy does he have after that one big explosion? Because in a lot of these cases, he will look good. And then the second things start going downhill for him, he can't really start to get any momentum back. Now, I think this is a good reset for Daniel De Silva, because like you had mentioned, it's not like he's gone without flashes of promise in his UFC tenure so far. Yes, he's 0-3 with three stoppage victory or three stoppage losses. And I will be completely honest, I said this to you before we started filming. I'm a little surprised they're giving him a fourth chance. I know that yeah. there have been flashes, but still, three stoppage losses. It's not like you're an Andre Arlovsky and you have a, a treasured history in the organization. No, and the thing that goes along with that is the fact that if you look at all 11 of his wins, all but one of them are first round finishes. So the, exactly. the, he finishes guys in the first round. He does a lot of flashy, crazy stuff. And De Silva, I put him in the same category with another Daniel from Brazil, Daniel Willicat, because both of those guys, explosive spinning attacks, they're first round type of guys. And in the UFC, we didn't see it. Now for Willicat... We finally saw it when he took yeah. on John Castaneda. Now, he got beat pillar to post in the first round. Castaneda tired out, and he beat him in the second round. But we'll see how this one plays out, because for Salvador, he's long, he's rangy. He beat just a terrible level of competition over in Brazil. And the guys that he lost to were pretty good. I mean, you look at the five on in, the one separation. loss to Jafel Filio, who's also in the UFC. I think that guy's going to go on to do some pretty exactly. impressive things. So we look at the odds in this matchup, Matt. We'll have a quick look. Uh, Salvador is the favorite. De Silva's the underdog at a plus 165 and Salvador's favorite at a minus 205. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprised us there to you. I'm going to say over under 75% Salvador just because De Silva's lost three times. I'll say under... Maybe? No, Way over. Wow. 722 total votes, 92% Salvador, 81% by knockout. For the 8% that have De Silva, 47% by decision. I think the 92% are just looking at the fact that De Silva just keeps getting finished and they just keep throwing him out there, so that's why. But it is... A more compelling matchup than the odds, and I think the fan vote would have you De Silva loves to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, though, and that really is an issue for me. Like, De Silva has had success, but not really in second rounds. We've never seen it in third rounds. Like, there's so many unknowns about De Silva, even though he has more questions answered. I, I know that's a wild way of describing it, but these guys fight to the level of their competition because of how wild they are. Like you had mentioned, Salvador is going to leave himself open to be hit by some big shots from De Silva. De Silva's also going to leave himself wide open to be hit by some big shots from Salvador. I think this is going to be a very fun fight for as long as it lasts. I could see this being like a one-round fight of the night type thing. Paul Daly, Nick Diaz type style. Ever 
so slightly I have Venetia Salvador in this matchup. I think with some of his power punching in his hands, he's going to be able to land some shots. But oh yes, this is like, as much of a guys, pop of popcorn as there can be. If Venetia Salvador is a 2-1 to one favorite, he beat Shannon Ross's last time out. Now Shannon Ross was better on paper than Venetia Salvador at everything. But Ross hadn't fought since 2020 and he was also... 32, 33 Salvador years old. Bang, bro. For Salvador before that, he beat Owen O. Vin- Wallace Vampirino, and then a 9-3 Takazio Gomez, and then Leonardo De Silva, who was a pro debut. So, Venetia Salvador, again, the level of competition wasn't great. I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in picking him. I'm going to pick him in this matchup against Daniel De Silva. I thought De Silva was going to be pretty good coming into the UFC. Again, I've seen the flashes, but his last time out against Altamirano drops him isn't really able to do much with it and drop, stumble, whatever it was. Then he gets hit by a left hook and a knee and he gets dropped and the wheels completely fall off the rails. So for me, for Matt, both of us going with Venetia Salvador in the matchup. Let us know down below in the comments section who you have in this matchup. Some big time fights, UFC 282. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. Big time grapplers matching up at UFC 282. We have the forever prospect. You guys know him. It's Eric Silva. No, it's a different Eric Silva. The king, Same the name. man from Lux fighting. He's coming into the UFC off a big win on Dana White's Contender Series, taking on another fellow Contender Series alum in downtown. TJ Brown looking to pick up the pieces after losing his last time out against Shailan Nordam Becca. And Matt, I want to talk about the guy who's more recently off Contender Let's Series because. We don't normally see 35-year-olds coming into the UFC making their debut. And if you watched last weekend's UFC Orlando card, you might have caught the blurb where they were accepting applications for the Ultimate Fighter. And they showed the age range and the cutoff was 34. But wait, Craig, how much am I supposed to weigh if I want to apply for the show? They did not say that, but apparently Bobby Maximus just blew the doors off them at 43 in the last season. But Matt, we talked about Eric Silva a lot on our Dana White's Contender Series show. We're going to give you all of the lowdown on him, update you on the fight he had against Anvar Boynazarov, and then touch down on this matchup here against downtown TV. Anvar Boynazarov. My favorite fight. Uzbekistan taking on Eric Silva, the forever prospect. No, but it is another Eric Silva. The king Eric Silva, Lux champion. I look at this matchup, and a lot of people might not know these two fighters. You need to know these two fighters. Now, Lux... I look at them and I go, geez, like, Hanato Valdez fought for Lux and he's in the UFC now and he got steamrolled by the steamroll of Matt Frivola. And we've seen fighters from Lux where I go, geez, I, I just don't know. And then I watch Eric Silva and I watch the guys that he's fighting and I go, wow, this guy really is a can't-miss prospect. But then everything else comes into it. So he is one of the best featherweights in Latin America. He hails from Venezuela, fights out of, uh, you know, a different country, but that's going to happen. You, you don't necessarily train from the country. You don't necessarily dance with the girl that you brought. So for Eric Silva... You're getting wild at parodies. The thing that I do like out of him, I look at him, he's 34 years old, and I go, geez. He's from Venezuela, I go, geez. Both these guys do have that problem, though, for being honest. He's at featherweight, he's 5'10". Is he Omar Morales? Like, I do. O- Omar Morales had to do the exact same thing, come in late in his career on contenders series and then push into the UFC. I think that's a really good point to bring up, but I'll also bring up what a lot of people said after Jeff Neal finished Vicente Luque. And I know hindsight's always 20-20, but still, Luque's like 78 years old in MMA years. He's been in some tough fights, whereas Jeff Neal, yeah, he's been in some crazy fights, but he takes a lot of time off after. He'll fight once in a blue moon. He's been a lot more conscious about really where his health is over time, but I agree with you. Both Anvar and Eric Silva have to look really good in this matchup because this chance to get signed by the UFC is more than likely going to be their last one, but I think this is by far the best fight in the card because for Eric Silva, phenomenal jiu-jitsu, and I know you're going to speak about it, a good striker too, not somebody who only has to go in there and look for the takedown to be able to have success in their fights. He can get it done on the feet too, but I compare both these fighters to Howie Barcellos, the guy who I all think we realize how good he was, but it felt like he really caught his stride as an MMA fighter a little bit too late in life. So I think this fight's going to be incredible. I think this is the one that everyone's going to be talking about after. If there's a double signing of any fight, this is probably going to be the one because it was so good going down the stretch, but still. Or, or you get a really early finish. I'll make my pick. I'm going to go with Eric Silva, the forever prospect, the Venezuelan. I love the striking, and the thing that I like about him he keeps his head back, which you don't necessarily love, but I do look at the way that Anvar strikes. He's 
been low in MMA. He does throw a lot of hooks. He throws the knee up the middle, like the leg kicks out of Silva. He has a great jab, but he's got a laser right hand to close the distance. His takedowns are great from open space They're and good. up against the fence. And I think his jujitsu is very, very good. I think it's going to be able to get the win. So Matt, Eric Silva took on Anvar Boynazarov, noted striker, kickboxer, and... Uh, Man, he beat the brakes off of him. And his right hand was an absolute laser in that one, like we knew. So now he's taking on TJ Brown. And again, I said from the start, this is a matchup between two primary grapplers because for Silva, his takedowns are great. They're lethal. His jiu-jitsu is quick. His back take's great. Like, he is a slick grappler. I almost liken him, and this is a stretch, but to a Jaltan Almeida type. That's just how quick he gets into position and how he's able to handle his opponents. Whereas for TJ Brown... He chains his takedowns exactly. together. He's grimy. He really is in there from round one to round three. This is an interesting matchup, though, because for Brown, he's had fights that he's won that have been questionable. He's had fights that he's lost that were questionable. And for Eric Silva, we haven't really seen him face resistance in a meaningful amount of time. And that's the question I kind of wanted to pose to you. For me, I think this fight comes down to pacing and cardio more than anything. Would you agree? Because I think both guys are going to want to get the fight to the mat. Don't get me wrong. I, I favor Silva on the outside on the feet a little bit more. I like his from point A to point B a little bit better. He has better footwork with his striking. But the thing about Brown is, like you mentioned, he is a grimier and he likes that kind of grit and grind style, if you will. Daniel Cormier made it famous. No, no, he's not DC, but he wants to get on top of you and make it ugly. He might not always get a submission win, but he's really going to wear on you with his physicality. The thing is, he's a guy who, let's say that is his style for round one and round two, and he's having a lot of success. He himself is going to get tired as that fight goes on, and he can almost outpace himself. And if that is the case, I could see Eric Silva starting to pull away and having success in the second half of the fight. But on the flip side, let's say TJ Brown is having trouble getting those takedowns, and Eric Silva's the one who's going out there getting a lot of those early explosions and having success. Could TJ Brown kind of flip the script and then just kind of become the Darren Elkins, if you will? Get on top of him and become that grindy fighter in the second and the third round? Because I think both these guys' styles do complement each other very well. And it's not often that you can say that both guys can use their cardio as an advantage. Well, and I mean, we saw that out of TJ Brown when he came into the UFC. Fights Jordan Griffin, takes him down seven times, gets caught in a submission, and that's kind of it that's for him. And Griffin, though. You, you look at Brown and his overall UFC career. He loses to Danny Chavez. He gets taken down and outstruck. That was kind of weird because Chavez is a strike. He beats Kai Kamaka by split decision. Matt, the judges' scorecards in that fight. Bell and D'Amato, 29-28 Brown. 30-27 uh, Adelaide Bird for Kamaka. 15-0 on MMA decisions. All scored it for Kamaka. He goes out there and beats Charles Rosa handily. Takes him down and handles him. And then he loses to Shailan Nordenbeka's last time out. Gets dropped in that fight. So then I went back and I watched TJ Brown's fights. And I went back and really frame by frame we're looking at them. Because he trains at a Westside MMA in Arkansas. Main training partner Bryce Mitchell who's on this card taking on Ilya Taparia. But for TJ Brown in his fights, Contender Series and UFC, fights Dylan Lockard. Well, I'd seen Dylan Lockard fight Jesse Erickson over with NEF before Lockard fought on Contender Series. Lockard drops him with a right cross in the first round. Kamaka drops him with a weird short right hand in the second round. Shailan Nordenbeka drops him with a right cross in the first round of their fight. TJ Brown kind of tends to drop this hand and gets hit by right hands, and Eric Silva has a tough right hand. They so, said that about Joe Lewis, too, and he's the greatest heavyweight of all time. Wild stuff. Maybe TJ Brown's on the way to a championship. I, I just... Brown's gritty. Brown gets dropped and doesn't really give up. And the other thing about Brown, you get him down, you get him with his back to the mat, he's not a wrestler. In that sense of the word, he point. can really sweep well off the back. He can really try and change positions around. So Brown is a slimy, slippery kind of guy when he gets to the mat. And Eric Silva is one of those guys that likes to take the back. So I love this fight. The odds in this one, Silva open to minus 225. Minus 122 right now. Brown open, plus 190, minus 100. So the odds closing in at par. Matt, we have a look at the top. All you both surprised to us as they are to you. I'm going to say over under 62.5% Silva. I think it's going to be over. It's going to be over. Oh, my. 733 total votes, 85% Silva, 22% by decision, 67% by submission. Okay. 15% that I have TJ Brown, 76% by decision. Matt, the fans have it overwhelmingly for Eric Silva, the second coming. Uh, but the odds closing in for TJ Brown. So what do you think here? I have it ever so slightly for Eric Silva, and I probably would have had a different opinion on this fight if I didn't see TJ Brown just fight Norton Becca, because Norton Becca, to a degree, is like a little bit more... 
I, I guess you need to have a more steady foundation than Eric Silva, maybe. But their skills are kind of the same. Like, could they're you, both that outside-inside striker who go for takedowns. Could you imagine if Eric Silva at 35 changed his body composition to look like Shailen Nordenbeck? I think it'd be impossible. Oh, my. But that's the thing about Silva. I think he can get some of the same work done from the outside that Nordenbeck had success with against TJ Brown. And the thing about Silva is, I don't think his style of grappling is going to tire himself out, which is something you have to worry about when you're fighting a guy like TJ Brown. Silva is going to try to get to that one dominant position position and stay there that doesn't really waste a lot of energy you're really just fighting for submissions at that point and that's also very tiring on the person who's defending those submissions as well so i like eric silva ever so slightly in this matchup but i think this is a difficult fight for him like you might look at both guys record and think wow the guy who's nine and one is gonna run over the guy who's 16 and nine but i think this is a very tightly matched fight yeah it should be a really fun one and i'm not necessarily down on silva at all for beating three and oh and for boy nazarov because that guy was a championship kickboxer the world over and it was a giant win Beat for silva so both of us going with Eric Silva in the matchup. I think it's going to be a really fun one. UFC 282, Blahovich versus Ank Live in the main event. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. This weekend at light heavyweight, we have the former title challenger OSP Ovince St. Preux coming in off a big time win by split decision over the aging legend, one of my favorite fighters Is it a big time win? of all time, Mauricio Shogun Hua. Of and originally course. coming up this weekend, he was supposed to be taking on Felipe Linz, Alexander Gustafsson, but on short notice, it was announced November 23rd by ESPN. So on two and a half weeks notice, we have Dana White's Contender Series 2019 contract winner, Malvado, Ooh. which means evil in Portuguese, Antonio Tricoli, coming in to take on OSP. And for Tricoli, training out of Brazil, we've seen him a little bit with Alex Pereira at a Glover Teixeira's gym, like, again, in the last month or so. But for Tricoli, one of the most interesting prospects coming into this like, one of the most interesting prospects I think I've ever seen because he started his career off, picked up a bunch of wins uh, at welterweight. And then he went from fighting in Brazil to fighting with LFA, and he fought Jacob Volkman, who was in the UFC for 10 fights, and lost to him, which is, okay, it's a skill check. You're a young guy. Yeah. And then he fights Diego Lima, who was coming off the Ultimate Fighter in the UFC. It didn't go well for him. And he broke his foot in that fight, and he lost that fight. And then it's like, what do we do? Pick up the pieces. He moves up to middleweight. He loses that fight, and then he takes a bunch of time well, off. What if I got bigger? And then he's a light heavyweight. So then he fights Kenneth Berg, Old Kenneth Berg on Contender Series. Now, Berg was one of those guys that everybody knew. He's tatted up from head to toe. He's a big guy he for is. 205. He was definitely favored to win that fight. And holy smokes, as a plus 160 underdog, Tricoli goes into that one. He gets clinched up against the fence for a lot of it. Then he lands a trip takedown. Then out of that, he's able to get a crazy neck crank submission up against it the cage. Insane. He wins that fight. He gets the contract. Dana White, I like everything about this kid. But they didn't like the fact that he tested positive for uh, Nandrolone after the fight. So he gets suspended, loses UFC contract. Tricoli goes out, fights a year ago against Wrestling Israel over with a Brazilian fighting series. Gets a win over there. And I didn't learn a fucking thing out of that fight because his opponent looked like a, a Walter Waite that just gained like, what, 35 pounds. Wow, just like him. That's my problem though. Whether I don't care what your opinion is of Antonio is. It doesn't matter in this fight, I don't think. I look at OSP on this scale. There's fighters who are in their 40s who fight like Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler fights like he has no money in his bank account and like you're trying to take everything from him. Like, he fights the same way he did when he was Inflation's young. gone up and Robbie needs bread. Like, Robbie Lawler bites down on the mouthpiece, though. He's always going to be that guy. Then you look at the other scale. Think about a guy like you had just mentioned, Alexander Gustafsson. He doesn't fight like that anymore. You know, like, not everybody ages as gracefully as a guy like Robbie Lawler. And I know Lawler has lost, you know, a lot more at this stage of his career. But he still fights in that same way. On what end of that scale is Ovin St. Pru right now? Because he almost lost to a Shogun last time out. And Shogun hasn't looked good in six years, seven. I'm not joking when I say that. Like, Mauricio Shogun, who was last meaningful win, was Jean Vellante in Brazil. And Jean Vellante wasn't a great fighter, for all just being honest. So, for OSP, I just really wonder how much left he has in the tank. He has been in some wild fights throughout his career, at 205 pounds, even at heavyweight. And I gotta be honest, him post kind of 37, 38, I like him more in the heavyweight division. We saw him fight Ben Rothwell, and he matched up pretty well physically with Rothwell, who is one of the biggest heavyweights we've ever seen. So, for OSP, I 
I don't like him continuously cutting this weight down to 205 at this stage of his career. I just don't think it's the proper move for him because we have seen him at heavyweight. We've seen how big he is in the heavyweight Yeah, division. and he got knocked out by Tanner Bowser there, too. I know he got knocked out by Tanner Bowser, but that's my question. So, how much is left in the tank for OSP? He hasn't won a, a real legitimate competitive tough fight in a really long time. So that's my question that I really do have. Because I thought the world OSP when he was at 205, when he was a borderline title contender. He had a great fight with Glover Teixeira. That, I, I know he lost that fight, but it was an incredible back and forth fight. He beat Shogun when Shogun was more in his prime in Japan. Like, there were some great wins that OSP has in his record. I just don't think he's that same fighter anymore. The thing I will mention, though, and we're going to mention this in the Bryce Mitchell, Ilya Tapuria fight is, when you think about Antonio, you think about his offensive grapple and you might forget about how good of a grappler OSP is. The thing is, OSP's style of grappling isn't necessarily, you know, long exchanges on the mat. He'll get into a dominant position, he'll use his strength, he can threaten with submissions on the mat, but I don't know if I love him grappling in this matchup for extended periods I, of time. I kind of like, so for Antonio, again, the wins and losses, the fight against Diego Lima was over five years ago, then he lost to Marcelo Barboza at 185 pounds, then he moves up to 205 four years ago, beats Rodrigo Carlos, who's 20 and 30. He beats Fabio Mojaya, who was 2-6. and six. That was four years ago. Salty. Beats Kenneth Berg as a big underdog. And then he beat Rezeli Asael, who was 7-1 and one a year ago. But again, his opponent was, like, definitely gained the weight to get up to that weight class. And he did well in the fight. He ran across the cage with his arms out, took him down, and then he ended up submitting him. But for Tricoli, I read an MMA Junkie article before he fought Berg on Contender Series. And in the plans for the future section, this was the quote. Before I was booked, I was already planning to go to 185 pounds, which is the best weight class for me. His last fight, as you can see from our graphic, was at 200 pounds at a catchweight. Tricoli is a guy that used to fight for a long time at welterweight. He's not a big 205er. You see it there too. They had him on Contender Series listed as 6'6 with a 79 and a half inch reach. He's also listed on some sites as 6'5 with an 82 inch reach. His legs are super, super skinny. Not that OSP is the biggest leg kicker, but out of his grappling, kicker. he's one of those guys that takes some liberties, and you've seen OSP really be able to punish guys in the past. In some of those exchanges, everybody goes back to the Tyson Pedro win that he had. Again, that one's years ago, but we have a look at the odds in this one. OSP opened the favorite, minus 150. He's at par right now. Tricoli opened plus 130 at par. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Surprise to us as they are to you. Uh, I'm going to say over under 65% OSP. I'll say under. I'm going to say under. It's close. It's slightly under. 511 total votes. 61% OSP, 62% by decision. For the 39% that I have Tricoli, 42% by decision, 30% by knockout. So the fans have OSP. The odds are at par. What's your pick here? I have OSP, but I hate the pick. Like, I don't like it at all. No, I, I have OSP too. OSP like has it. not looked good in a meaningful period of time. I cannot stress that enough. I know we had kicked Corey Anderson at MSG way back when at 217. One of the great knockout wins that you will ever see because it's filthy. But the thing about OSP is he never had great volume even in his prime. But when he landed those kicks, he made them fucking count. I just, like, he doesn't throw anything anymore. That's the problem with OSP. Yeah, like, even in his win over Alonzo Menafield, it was wait, 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 exactly. wait, wait, wait. And, and if you do walk into that big shot, he's going to look really good because he still carries that power when he is able to land. He just doesn't give himself that many opportunities to land the big power because he doesn't have a lot of volume at this stage of his career. So I like him for the reasons that we mentioned. I think he is going to have a size advantage. He does have good takedown defense. I'm going to disagree a bit. I do think he is going to struggle in some of those elongated grappling exchanges if he finds himself on the mat because with OSP, OSP, I think a lot of his grappling does come down to his physical strength. You look at his submission win over Fabio Charant, even look at the armbar he had over, uh, like you had mentioned, Tyson Pedro. A lot of that comes down to his strength. It's not him taking them down, getting in their full guard, passing the half guard. It's really slam, takedown, scramble, try to get that submission. And that's why I do think Antonio can have success if he does go for the takedown. I just think he's going to struggle with getting the Both takedown. guys are really tough, and I made the mistake earlier. I said that Tricoli broke his foot in the fight against Diego Lima. He broke his foot against Berg and still won the contract. OSP broke his arm against John Jones just kept on fighting so both these guys with wicked durability I like OSP ever so slightly but uh yeah really eager to hear what people have to say in the comment section about this fight both of us going with the man that's known as OSP and this should be an interesting fight in this 205 pound division because they need prospects for they sure do. we have a big time fight in this weight class for the title up at the top Jan Blahovic taking on Magomed Ankle Live. You're not going to want to miss. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, we always say. Let's get into it. 
the featherweight debut of 18 fight veteran Alexander the Great Ape Hernandez. I don't know why he's switching to featherweight. I don't know why he switched his nickname before the Hanato Moicano fight. Because that's got to be the worst nickname I've ever heard. You go from the you, great I gotta be to a, the great ape. You do seem to say this about like every single event. You're like, this is the worst nickname I've ever heard. There's some bad ones. You're going to need like a tier list of your most like hated nicknames. If you want that, comment below. But when you look at this for Hernandez, 5-4 and four in the UFC at lightweight. Obviously, his best win was his UFC debut against the now fourth ranked lightweight. That was Benil Dariush. Knocked him out very, very quickly. But for Hernandez, last time out against... Call of Duty streamer Hanato Moicano, he just wasn't really able to flow with the shots that were coming at him, and he ended up getting submitted. What did you make of that performance, and are you at all surprised that he's moving down to featherweight? Not really, because it has been a conversation. Is it something I think is a great idea for his career? Probably not, but they're not asking me for my opinion on this. But I'm a little surprised to see it at this stage. I remember that was a conversation after he suffered his loss to Cowboys Throne. It was, hey, Cowboys a lot bigger than I am. I might need to move down to 145. Just physically, I'm not sure if this is a division for me. But he went on to have some success at 155 pounds. But here, I'm just going to bring up his record very quick on Tapology. The hard thing to do with Alexander Hernandez is really predict where he belongs in the division. Because if you look at his losses, they're all quite forgivable. He lost to a Cowboy Cerrone who, although was old in his UFC career and in his MMA career in general. That being what? His third fight in the UFC? That's a pretty big step up in competition. So you lose to Cowboy, no big deal. <laughs> He should have lost to Francisco Trinaldo, and I'm not a big this guy should have won, this guy should have lost, but he got a hometown decision in San Antonio when he fought Francisco Trinaldo, and I will take that to my death. So we'll just leave that right there. Lost to Drew Dober, another good fighter in the division, beats Chris Grutzmacher. Performance of the night over Chris Grutzmacher. What? Okay, he got a, whether he gets a bonus or not, he gets a finish over Chris Grutzmacher, who's not a ranked fighter, and I think we can just leave it at that. Loses to Moises, who's a really good fighter, beats Mike Brendan, who isn't on this Mike level. Mike Breeden. Mike Breeden, sorry. And then loses Loses to Hanato Moicano, another great fighter. So the weird thing about Hernandez is, if you take out the Benil Dariush win, a lot of his wins are over guys who you kind of do expect him to win. And that's why it does feel like we're always trying to reset our expectations for Alexander Hernandez. So maybe that's his idea. He's only 30 years old. He's not the oldest guy in the world. So there is still a little bit of time to grow. But I think this is an interesting fight against Billy Q because... For Hernandez, we do question his chin at 155. He's been hit by some really big shots, and he's not a guy who recovers well after he does get hurt. Fighting a guy like Billy Q, whose X factor, if anything, is his cardio, is his volume. I do worry about how Hernandez is going to look if he does get hurt at some point in this fight, because... Billy Quarantillo is not a guy who, we laud a guy like Jeff Neal, for instance. He gets somebody hurt, he stays composed, he stays composed. Billy Q says, fuck all that. He goes for you. It's that avalanche of shots. I don't know if Hernandez's wrestling is going to be good enough to get him out of some of those sticky positions on the feet. Well, and for Hernandez, he does get hit quite a bit. He's only been knocked down truly once in the UFC against Cowboy Cerrone. But if you go back and you watch frame by frame, he does get hit by a lot of shots in his fights. And it kind of deters his overall game plan. And trying to get back into the fight can be a little difficult for him but if you look at it for Quarantillo his last fight out like he was in an absolute barn burner against Shane Burgos he had good success in the first round the end of the second round he gets hammered on oh. and then in the third round it's just a back and forth and he ends up losing that one and Burgos goes on he fights Charles Jolden and then he goes to the PFL and can't fight Marlon Moraes and nobody needed to see that fight but for Billy it's been an interesting kind of draw so far in the UFC and he's one of those guys that's Maybe build as a bit of a wrestler, or maybe build as a bit of a he's boxer. A Swiss Army knife. He's he's an MMA fighter, but the only thing he doesn't do is throw leg kicks. And if you want hard proof, UFC and Dana White's contender series, seven fights under the banner, he's five and two, eight leg kicks, two leg kicks, one. 12, 6, 7, and 7. That's an average of 6.14 leg kicks per fight. And he doesn't do it at all. And neither does Alexander Hernandez. So both guys tend to primarily box and both guys will wrestle. And I'm sure Hernandez moving down to 145, even though he trains at Factory X Muay Thai, a big part of this could be the wrestling. And he might go back and watch the success that Gavin Tucker had against Billy exactly. Q in the grappling and think, hey, that could be for me. Because if you match these two guys up by the output that they throw, they both had about the same amount of fights in the UFC. And for Hernandez, 3.97 to 3.94 significant strikes landed to take in per minute. And for Billy Q, you want a wild number. 7.74 to 5.80. Like, he throws a lot more. He accepts a lot more. And he, he had a fight of the night win uh, two fights ago against Gabriel Benitez. And maybe he could have even gotten a bonus the last time he fought, which was just over a year ago against Shane Burgos. 
nobody likes to talk about stuff like this, but we just saw it last weekend. Like, Kyle Dawkins recently had some pretty serious surgery on his face, and then when he got hit by big shots from Eric Anders, he just didn't react the same way to them. And that's fair to say. We all saw it. Something that happened. Alexander Hernandez does not like getting hit clean. And that's what I do worry about in this matchup. Because when he does start getting into some of those tough fights, the thing about Hernandez is he does have really good footwork on the outside. A lot of wrestlers really have some of that plodding footwork, especially wrestle boxers like an Alexander Hernandez. But he moves too much. And I think that's... He's kind of gone too far with it, I think. Even go back to the Cowboy fight. I know Cowboy's a long-rangey guy, so it's tough to get into his range. But it's just Hernandez doing those half circles on the outside, eating a lot of big shots from range. So I agree with you. I think Hernandez is going to have success, he's going to have to put on the wrestling shoes because Billy Q with his striking style on the outside, I think is going to give Hernandez a lot of problems because when Hernandez does start to get on the receiving end of some of the volume, he just doesn't make the best decisions. He'll kind of get that deer in headlights and I think if that is a, a scenario that happens, Billy Q can go for the finish. He's like a shark. When he smells blood, he really goes for it. But like you said, after seeing the success that Gavin Tucker had against Billy Quarantillo, Alexander Hernandez could definitely well, replicate that type of a and game plan. Billy took us and put us on a poster after he beat Gabriel Benitez on his Instagram page, and everybody and their dog came out of the woodwork to rip on us. But Billy admitted it. In the fight against Gavin Tucker, it was a body kick that really threw everything off. He lost his win, then he started to get taken down. He couldn't get back into the fight. Burn burner against Shane Burgos. The thing that I like out of Hernandez is he's one of those guys that'll play peekaboo, put that lead hand out there to try and gauge, and then he plays around on the outside, whereas Quarantillo will just throw everything in the kitchen sink on the straight line back out straight back straight back so there could be a good opportunity for Hernandez to cut angles in this one it's just can he match the volume that's coming at him from a guy like Quarantillo so this could be a really good fight we look at the odds in this one Quarantillo open to minus 210 minus 170 we have a look at Hernandez open plus 180 plus 140 topology vote surprise to us there to you I know Quarantillo is a big favorite. I have no idea where the top all votes are going to be. I'm going to say over under 70% Quarantillo, but even I think they're going to be under that. Oh, I think they're going to be over 80%. See, I have no idea. Oh, close look at that. Up. They're close. So 791 total votes, 78% Quarantillo, 71% by decision. For the 22% that have Hernandez, 52% by decision, 36% by knockout. In this one, I think Billy Quarantillo is going to be able to get the win. I think just having that experience at 145, making that cut consistent, consistently, I know he's an inch taller, and I know he has two inches less of reach, but it's just been a thing for him. He had great success over with King of the Cage before he came into the UFC, lower weight class, but I just for me, it's the boxing, the fact that he was able to cut through a 75 and a half inch reach advantage that Burgos had. He was able to hang with the boxing of a guy like Burgos. He didn't really have good success when Burgos started to whip those leg kicks out there. They compromised his movement. But Hernandez doesn't throw a lot of leg kicks his own. So when it's primary boxer, boxer, grappler, grappler, I'll take Quarantillo on this one. I like Quarantillo in this fight too. The thing about Hernandez, like I said, he doesn't react well to pressure and Billy Quarantillo puts a lot of pressure on you. Now, if Hernandez can respond to that pressure with some of his own takedown attempts, I think he can have success. He is the heavier guy on top. The thing about Quarantillo is he's a really good grappler. He has great submission ability, but if you are the stronger, more dominant guy in that top position, he's not somebody like a Brian Ortega who's got that one hit, one kill jiu-jitsu off his back. He can be held down. So if Hernandez can bring down some of that wrestling success that he had at 155, like he had against OAM, that was a really nice performance from Hernandez. I think it could have success, but again, your chin doesn't get better when you cut more weight. And the thing about Hernandez is we've seen him get rocked a lot. He may have only been knocked down one time. Drew Dober put him on a knee about six times in that fight, though, and had him wobble for minutes on end. So I do worry about Hernandez eating the power shots of Billy Quarantillo. I think this is going to be a really fun fight, though. I cannot stress that enough. Big time fight in the featherweight division. Both of us going with Billy Quarantillo, who turns 34 this week. So happy birthday to him. We have some big time fights left on this card. I'm really looking forward to Bryce Mitchell and Ilya Tapuria. So make Make sure you check that one out. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. Middleweight bangers set to square off coming up this weekend at UFC 282. It's a home game for the action man, Chris Curtis. He was a winning corner last weekend, repping his boy, Roman Delidze, that calf slicer, that ground and pound against Jack Hermanson. And that was a great revenge fight for Delidze because that, of course, was Curtis's last loss. So he was able to bring that into the cage, help out his pupil, and move forward, taking on New Mansa, Joaquin Buckley, who is a walking highlight reel. Now, both of these guys had big win streaks snap their last time out for Chris Curtis. Again, Hermanson for Joaquin Buckley taking on Nasruddin Imovov. 
And Buckley looked like two weight classes smaller in that one. Like, I could Which not... Which is weird, because I always think he's kind of big for the division. I know he's short, but he's built like a brick shit house. Yeah, no, Imovov was like that, massive. You're right. And for Buckley, he did have some successes in that fight, and we can kind of break it down round by round, but... He was a pretty big underdog there. He's a plus 200. Uh, one round three on two of the three scorecards. He came out like a bat out of hell knowing he needed to win that third round. And if you watch just the last, what was it, like 20 seconds? He's just out there running across the cage, throwing everything he can and landing on Imavov. But Imavov's got a great chin. So for Buckley, he brings all of that experience into the cage, the Bellator experience, the UFC fights. And he's taking on a guy who has maybe the most experience in all of MMA. And Chris Curtis. And for Curtis, you might be sour on his last performance against Jack Hermanson because... He didn't look like the guy that we saw in the UFC it just wasn't making the debut. Like he had beat Phil Haas, Brennan Allen, and Vieta by being offensive and throwing with a lot of power. And against Hermanson, he was kind of tentative on the outside and didn't throw a ton. And just like Billy Quarantillo, Chris Curtis is known to frequent the comments section below the Fight Night Picks videos. So for Curtis, I expect him to be, you know, full Chris Curtis. Full powers Curtis. I expect full powers Buckley. And I'm really looking forward to this fight. I don't look at it as a 35-year-old and a 28-year-old. These are two game guys in the middleweight division with your 14th rank Curtis and just like the 16th middleweight in Joaquin Buckley in this fight. And that does feel like where Joaquin Buckley is in the division because he can beat pretty much anybody on the outside of the rankings. That's the type of power that he, does, that he does carry in his hands. But the guys who have a little bit more refined technique in the rankings are going to give him trouble. We saw that a lot in the Imovov fight. Imovov a lot more straight shots whereas Buckley throws those big looping hooks but that's why i think this fight should be so entertaining the forward style of joaquin buckley should bring out a lot of the own offense that we see from chris curtis but i gotta be honest i'm pretty down on chris curtis based on his last performance and the reason I say that is Chris Curtis is a classic example of I might not be the best wrestler in the world, but my wrestling is good enough to negate your strengths as a wrestler. I have good enough takedown defense to force you to become a striker. And normally when he has those wrestlers become strikers, that's when we see Chris Curtis really become aggressive, put his combinations together, go to the body a lot, which is something I really like out of Chris Curtis, and then finish with combinations up to the head. We didn't really see that version of him in the Jack Hermanson fight. And yes, that might just be he has to respect the grappling threat of a guy like Jack Hermanson but he had just done pretty much the same thing to Adolfo Vieira. And if you're not worried about the grappling styles of Adolfo Vieira, you probably wouldn't be about Hermanson too. So I'm just a little curious to see what version of Chris Curtis we will get moving forward. Not that I think he's just a completely different fighter. I just, I want to see more of the first fighter that we saw him come into the UFC. And I do think that this fight stylistically with Buckley is going to force him to become more of that boxer. I will be curious though to see who's going to be moving forward. Because I think the guy on the back foot, although yes, they can land that one big power shot. I don't know if Buckley's going to want to have the pressure of Chris Curtis coming towards him, throwing some of those combinations with his back up against the cage. I think that's going to be a really difficult position for him to be in. If you look at it for Joaquin Buckley in the OC, performance bonuses against Kasanganai, against Jordan Wright, against Ahoyo, and against Albert Durai of a fight that he was losing until... You know, Albert Drive's just got one eye that blows up every time like a balloon, and it happened in that the one. He, he got a great win right there. But if you do look at it, Buckley can kind of struggle against guys that throw a lot of kicks. Chris Curtis isn't a giant kick-heavy guy, unless it's on Dana White's Contender Series. And he really does like to let his boxing go. And the thing that Curtis does well, he's a great counter striker. So Buckley's a guy that rushes forward a lot. Curtis can have a lot of success in those exchanges. We saw that in the Phil Haas fight. Curtis is great at defending takedowns. And if he's a better grappler than his opponent, go back to his fight in the PFL against Andrea Fialio. Well, he's having success on the feet. I'm going to take it down to the mat. Wow, I had even more success. So Curtis really well-rounded that way. Love the boxing combinations out of both stances. It's just the willingness to move forward and get going. And Curtis can struggle if you're a distance striker, like Jack Hermanson. If you have a lot of success on the outside, that's where you can kind of struggle. Okay, do I move forward? Are you going to make me come back and I counter? Because if it's all the way out, he can have a little bit of a struggle. But for Buckley, I know the reach, it's an extra inch, but he likes to really crowd his opponents and lunge in with a lot of his shots. It really comes down to how good are you at fighting peekaboo style boxers when you're fighting Joaquin Buckley. And it's as simple as that. It really is. Like, if you're a guy who can time his ducks and hit him before he can land 
land the hook, you're gonna beat him. Like, Kevin Holland beat the brakes off Joaquin Buckley, and I know it was his first fight in the UFC, but that it was... It was on of, short notice, And too. it was, but that was one of those performances where you just kind of realize what happens when everything goes wrong. It happens every now and then, where just stylistically, it doesn't really work out for you, and Buckley was quite a bit bigger than Kevin Holland. I know Holland was taller than him in that fight, but Buckley was obviously much larger than Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland's a thin guy. We saw it even at Walter Wade. But Buckley, he would get timed every single time he tried to do his duck, and Kevin Holland would hit him with a straight right right down the middle. The difference between Holland, though, and his style of striking and Chris Curtis is Curtis is a lot more likely to counter it with a hook, and I do worry that that makes Curtis a little bit more susceptible to the big shot himself, and that's why I think this is a very 50-50 fight, honestly. Like, Joaquin Buckley could win by first round knockout. I would not be surprised whatsoever. If Chris Curtis went out there, moved forward, went to the body, started landing combinations, he could also win by first round knockout, and I would not be surprised at all. Yeah, and Curtis opened a plus 105. He's a plus 120. Buckley, minus 125 to a minus 140. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise to us there, to you. I'm going to say over under 70% Buckley. That's tough. Ah, I thought you were going to say Curtis the favorite. It broke my brain. I'll say under. You're going to say under, and it's, whoa. Wow, 827 total votes, 62% Curtis, 60% by decision, 33% by knockout. For the favorite Buckley, 38% have him to win, 55% by decision, and 38% by knockout. I think Chris Curtis wins this fight because he's such a good counter striker. And for Joaquin Buckley, again, would I be surprised if he won? Not at all. But Curtis, what I like out of him, he's got a good chin. He's got good durability. He's got, and those things go hand in hand, but he also has good cardio as well. So I like him in a matchup like this. But for Buckley, what I learned out of him in his last fight, he's not out in the third round. And even though he has a lot of those big actions and he gets taken down and he gets completely just outclassed, He's always in these fights, and I love what I saw of him even in the losses last time out. And that's why I have a key. Again, I think this is as 50-50 of a fight as there is. This is basically Chris Curtis versus Biggie Boy in the middleweight division because whoever lands first could put the other one out. I agree with you. Chris Curtis has a good chin. I don't think you want to test that against Joaquin Buckley, though, by well, any means. just a second. You said I don't think anybody should ever test their takedown defense or grappling against Adolfo Vieta, but Chris Curtis must have ice water what? in his veins. No, I didn't. I said if you're not worried about the grappling yeah, of Vieira, no, then worried. you shouldn't be worried about the grappling of Hermanson, and right. he was. That's what I said. And he I like Joaquin Buckley in this. Go ahead. Yeah, you've got Buckley. I've got Curtis. It is a great and fight. I'll be curious to see, too, how they look physically, because in my mind, I still think Buckley is a bigger guy than Chris Curtis. I will be curious to see, because now that one of these guys are the tallest middleweights in the world, they're both normally going to have a height disadvantage, but I'll just be curious to see how they match up physically. The hair definitely gives an advantage to Chris Curtis. We know this, oh. but should be a great fight. Can't wait for it coming up in this card. Let us know down below in the comments section who you have. Big time fight at the top. It is the light head heavyweight belt on the line it's vacant blahovich taking on ank alive keep it locked in with fight name picks we always say let's, let's get, get into it it's short to like please Ridiculous. i'm trying <laughs> look at don't just I'm stop trying. It. <laughs> the fans are like i'm trying I'm after just over a year on the shelf we have the return of the golden boy edmund shabazian now repping extreme couture after a complete blitz all the way up to the rankings he's lost three straight and hasn't really had that whole glitz and glam that he did on the way up. He's taking on Dolce champion, Dolce Lungjambula, the former EFC heavyweight and light heavyweight champ, who's lost three in a row himself and hasn't really had the greatest of run. Although we can break it down frame by frame and pick out some spots where he has been good. Because in his loss to Cody Brundage, he was beating him pillar to post until he got caught in one of the sickest guillotines I've ever seen. I can tell in your voice that you're on the same page as me. I'm too excited for this fight. Don't this you... fight means nothing in the grand scheme of things, but this fight to me is for the middleweight title of the world. Because for Dolce, you're right. Like, imagine what our opinions of were the of were of these guys when they first came to the UFC. And then think about the thoughts that you have about them right now. Like for Edmund Shabazian, he was the prince that was promised. This was the Ronda Rousey. She was his mentor. He was in her training camp when she was champion. He was brought up by Edmund Tarverdi. And like Edmund Shabazian at one point was supposed to be Sean O'Malley 2.0. And I'm not joking when I compare him to a guy like Sean O'Malley. They were on very similar trajectories. Hell, Edmund got a main event of a fight night. That doesn't happen to any fighter in the UFC. And I do think we have to start giving respect to people who do 
big main events. Like, that's a big deal. There's only a handful of those slots that get handed out. You're normally a top-ranked fighter in your division. I know Kevin Holland was unranked, but I think he gets a bit of a pass. He's a pretty famous guy. Everybody likes Kevin Holland. So Edmund Shabazian, at one point, was thought that highly of in the division. And it is kind of unfortunate that this is really a loser-goes-home fight between Dolce Lynchambula and Edmund Shabazian. Two pretty good fighters. Edmund's last win, there's two big names on this card whose last wins came on UFC 244, Masvidal versus Diaz. Edmund's one of them. Darren Till's the other one. They haven't won since 2019. So Edmonds now just recently turned 25. He was 21 when he won that last fight against Brad Tavares. He was a minus 400 against Derek Brunson his next time out. And he did not win that but fight. But can I be honest, though? I bought into the hype after the Brad Tavares knockout because that was really impressive. Like, you can beat Brad Tavares. A lot of guys beat him by decision. It's tough to head kick knockout Brad Tavares in the first round. And that's what Edmund Shabazian did. And that was the thing about Edmund on his way up. I had said this a lot about Cyril Gunn, and it made Craig roll his eyes every single time I said this. It was okay. I'm going to get a better opinion on this guy once he is in a difficult fight. Then he fought Alexander Volkov, was in a difficult fight, and I thought a lot higher of him afterwards. That was my issue with Edmund Shabazian, though. I bought into the hype because he was looking so good in all these fights. I know his uh, debut was a split decision against Aaron Stewart, but still, he was just wrestling for the majority of that. So, at this point, he was showing skills in the UFC against high-level guys that are difficult to get out of there, and it was enough for me to really think, wow, if Edmund Shabazian could keep on getting better time in and time out, because at the time, this is a 22-year-old is going in there getting better against fighters who are better. I really was sold, but I do think we have started to see that once he gets into that difficult fight, it, it does start so, to get difficult for Edmund. So for Shabazian, the big thing that you really have to kind of reel it in and think about it, 11 and 3, 10 of his wins are in the first round, and only one of them's by decision. It was that split decision win over Darren Stewart. I thought he lost. And a lot of people thought Darren Stewart won that one, but the real kicker was Stewart was able to out-wrestle him in that one and tire him out as the fight went on. And for Shabazian, you go back and you look at the three-fight losing streak. Okay, he lose to Derek Brunson. He as took a, a lot of damage. Minus 400 favored in the third round. He got 10 aided The total strikes 99-4 to four in favor of Brunson. Took on Jack Romanson. Seven minutes and... Uh, 11 seconds of control time. And remember the ground right. pound? Yeah, that was the, the Hermanson fight was the 99 to 4 in the third round. So Hermanson had the 10 8. Rather, for Derek Brunson, it was just controlled all over the mat. And then the fight against Nasruddin Imovov, like, first round was competitive. Second round, Imovov starts to land. Shabazian clinches him up. Then Shabazian tries to engage in the grappling. He had the front choke attempt there from Imovov. He rolls him down to the ground, gets him into the clinch, and then Shabazian pulls guillotine which then ultimately leads to his demise where he ends up in crucifix and gets elbowed into the ground. So Shabazian's had about a year off. For Lungambula, you heard it kind of in the intro there, DC talking about his thighs. This guy, the heavyweight champ with EFC, knocked out Alain Badeau. Light heavyweight champ, Andrew Van Zyl was one of the wins. Then he comes into the UFC, beats Daquan Towns and looks amazing. Fights Magam Nankalaev, gets front kicked. Then he fights Marcus Perez. Now, this is the thing about Dolce. He's this big flashy striker. He throws a big wild looping overhand right, but he doesn't really do a whole lot more than that. However, in the Perez fight, he decides to conserve his energy, utilize the judo, because he was wild. on the Congolese judo team from 2007 to 2010, and he looked really good against Marcus Perez, who doesn't have the best gas yeah. tank in the world. He takes on Mac Andre Barrio, tries to get the takedowns early, he gets power barred. And then he got power barred and ground out. Takes on Cody Brundage, beats him pillar to post until they get into the clinch. And then Cody pulls uh, for that guillotine and gets it and gets a performance bonus. And his last time out against Puna Soriano, he added a wrinkle to his game. He switched to southpaw and threw a leg kick and it dropped Puna the first time he did it. And it really did affect him. But as he got backed up, it was that, what was it? Flat line. Yeah, it was a left hook or uppercut overhand right. And, and it was a beautiful combination. Counter. So... Yeah, it was tough. Left hook knockout there for Puna Soriano. So for Dolce, it's, is he going to be able to withstand the speed and the power that Shabazian has in that first round? Or can Dolce somehow turn back the clock and make it past the second third? That's the difficult thing for Dolce in this matchup. I think if this was his first fight in the UFC, and if Edmund was at this stage of his career, then I think it would be a much more winnable fight for him. I think he would be able to withstand some of those earlier blitzes. But I think Edmund's going to carry a massive speed advantage in this fight. I really do. And even if, let's say, Dolce hits a little bit harder, I do think Shabazian has deceiving knockout power. Like, when he cracks in the first round, especially when he's got all of his cardio, like, he puts guys away. He hurt Brad Tavares with a straight right down the middle, too. Like, he does have a very surprising punching power 
And he is a big guy, too, for the division. And that's the other thing that you have to remember. Edmund's going to be... It, it says here on Topology, Dodge is 5'8". He might look like a big guy, but he's not the tallest fighter in the world. Edmund, in your mind, is not the biggest guy. And then you watch him fight guys like Derek Brunson, and he dwarfs them in size. So I think Edmund... I, if he's going to win a fight in the UFC, this is the getting back on the horse type of a fight. And I can hear it already. Edmund looks good against Dolce. Let's say he gets another TKO victory. And you've got Joe Rogan saying he's back. Edmund's back. Because he probably never watched the fight night cards where he lost. Well, so I think this is a good stylistic matchup for Edmund. But this is a bad stage of Edmund's career. Like, both guys need to win. Dolce has been training at Killcliffe FC. But for a while there, he was training at Extreme Couture. So... Maybe the book's out on Dolce at Extreme Tour where Shabazian's gone to train because he's been a Phoenix guy for the longest time. Glendale guy, Glendale fighters, Edmund Tarverdi and head movement. But I'm eager to see what Shabazian's able to implement from that game plan. I'd like to know if he's training with Dewey Cooper because Dewey Cooper was the Dolce Lundjambula guy. Black Cobra striking system zone, no right sleeve, hand up in the air. Wow. My favorite coach. But when I look at this matchup, Matt, Francis need it more. We only write down the odds right before the fight, and you went down to grab yourself some water. Edmund open minus 450. He's a minus 320 favorite. Yeah. Lundjambula open plus 350, plus 247. Now, the top all votes are a surprise to us there to you, and I'm going to assume... That Edmund's a big favorite there because both guys are on three fight losing streaks and one guy's twenty or one guy's twenty five, one guy's thirty five. I thought Shabazian would be a favorite, but not that big. I'll say over under eighty two and a half percent. I'll say over. Yeah, uh, eight hundred twelve total votes, ninety two percent Shabazian, twenty percent by decision, sixty eight percent by knockout for the eight percent that have Lunchambula, seventy one percent by knockout. If the odds were like minus two hundred, I go oh, okay. Well, that's not so bad on Shabazian. They're minus 320 right now. They open minus 450. I like Edmund, like I said a little bit earlier on. Speed advantage, the variety of attacks. But Dolce Lunjambula, overhand right, so paw with the leg kick, and then he, if he can implement his own takedowns, Dolce is a force in all aspects of MMA. It's just neither one of these guys have exceptional cardio, and would it surprise me if Dolce threw up a giant upset victory? Not one bit in this fight. I wouldn't be surprised, but I do think this is a difficult matchup, just from a Styles perspective, because Dolce does throw looping shots. Yes, they're effective when they land, but Edmund throws pretty clean punches down the middle. Dolce doesn't throw a jab, whereas Edmund will pot out there quite a exactly. bit. Exactly, and I do like the straight right out of Shabazian. It's a very damaging strike when he is able to land it. The accuracy's not great, the output's not great, but again, when it is able to land, it is quite devastating and i like his chances to land a straight punch more than dolce's looping one so i like edmund in this matchup but it, again i, I was kind of ragging on rogan or dc or whoever's going to cut the promo for edmund's back this is a good step you know uh, maybe he will show us a new wrinkle like you had mentioned being an extreme couture and that's all you can ask for because you do hate to see a guy who had as much talent as edmund had especially earlier on in his ufc career just go on a four fight losing streak and get forgotten about it would be nice to see him find a new gym add a new wrinkle to his game and have some newfound success because he's only 25 years old he should be able to still get better and i think he will be able to in this fight big time matchup in the middleweight division both of us going with the golden boy taking on champion Dolce Lunjambula, but both of us again with Shabazian in the matchup. The next fight on this card, a couple of guys that have trained together, albeit briefly, and Jay Perrin taking on Raul Rosas Jr., the 18-year-old, making his UFC debut. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks, we always say. Let's get into it. Raul Rosas Jr. set to make his UFC debut. He just turned 18 back in October, looking to take on the former CES and Cage Titans Bantamweight champ, the Joker Jay Perrin, who switched his nickname. He used to be Savage Jay Perrin. The Joker, it is what it is, but a couple of fights under his belt with the UFC. Took his debut on four days' notice against Mario Bautista. Withstood that test, lost the decision his last time out. Lost the decision that was somewhat controversial against Arichi Long. He unleashed a wicked combination in about the last 20 seconds of that fight. Surprised that Arichi Long didn't go down, but an amazing fight in that one. And we have a great pairing coming up this week. And we talked a lot about Raul Rosas Jr. Oh, yeah. before his Dana White's Contender Series debut against Mando Gutierrez. We're going to throw it back to that Contender Series pre preview talk about the fight and really try and hammer home a pick on this one because it could be a little bit but Matt Raul Rosas Jr. coming in at 17 years old this guy is the prospect this guy is stealing the headlines this guy is going out there lots of interviews he's just a few weeks away from his 18th birthday so the parents still have to sign the permission slip for him to be able to fight 
all of his fights have taken place in Mexico. This is his first fight in the States. The the fights they had with UWC is the organization. You've seen UWC fighters come into the UFC. Just like every other fighter that's on this card has not fought the best level of competition. The fighters he's faced, 0-1, 0-1, 1-0, 2-0, 0-2. 0-2. Who the hell wants to fight a kid that's like 16, 17 years old? That's going to be the, the only hard one feels kind of weird about this. Yeah, like, the of fact everything that... we know about concussions and CTE and stuff at this point, like Will Smith made a pretty good movie about it that just focused on football. And I think we all understand just how violent of a sport well, MMA is compared to a sport like football. So I'm sure that's a real thing in this sport and... as well. My point being is it is just a little weird, isn't it? Like, I, I'm not saying you have to feel super uncomfortable about it. You don't get to join PETA to say there's something wrong about this fight. I'm just saying. It's a little strange. That's all. Like, there's well, enough good fighters in the regional scene who are looking for an opportunity like this that you don't need to have some sort of weird, uh, for lack of a better term, a freak show fight. This is like uh, drafting Manute Ball and Muggsy Bogues on the same team just to draw up attendance. Like, you don't need to do these weird gimmicky things. Contender Series already has a pretty big following. It already guarantees fighters a UFC spot built basically at this point if they win. So it's just it's a weird situation. That's all I'm going to say. Well, I, I th- it feels like a developmental deal if he wins because I know You're right. You're Michael right. had to fight twice. And for Rosas Jr., the other thing, what, there's only 11 weeks in this year's season of Contender Series? So it's not like they're going to bring him back for another episode. But he started off as an amateur at 15. He started training in MMA at age four because his dad got into MMA late in his dad's life. So he just kind of brought Raul with him to the gym. And he is a really impressive fighter. I mean, he trains at a syndicate, 10 Planet Jiu-Jitsu in Las Vegas, and in the promo pack, they kind of had him take shots at Aljamain Sterling, Marlon Vera, and Piotr Jan's game, which is really awkward. Oh, that'd be like that'd be like me playing hockey in a beer league, and and then going, "Geez, well, Connor McDavid, I, I, he doesn't play good defense." It's Sidney Crosby; he could get more points every year. Like it, just, it was a weird look for I've me. I've heard you talk after those games, Craig. That's basically <laughs> what it is. But both of these guys, Matt, a little bit of an amateur record. You look at both of these guys, their fighting styles match up so well because I will tell you this, and I'll hand it off to you this way, Matt. These guys both fight the same way. They both go balls to the wall in the first minute and a half, and usually the fight ends in the first round. Well, for for Rosas Jr., it's fin- all of them have finished very, very quickly. They power grapple. They power strike. They have styles that are conducive to getting finished or getting finishes very quickly and not to conserving gas tanks. And you might go, well, Craig, It's a 17-year-old. He's going to have a really good gas tank. How do you know? He's only ever gone completely balls to the wall very early in fights. So I don't know what his gas tank is going to look like in the second round. Think about how poorly you treated your body when you were 17. Like, I played basketball. It would eat nine meals of McDonald's in between games. I was a national championship athlete at 17, Matt. Softball Canada. Let's go. Okay, Craig, settle down. I was eating like nine junior chickens in between basketball games and putting up numbers, okay? Like, <laughs> you can do that kind of stuff when you're 17 years old and get away with it. For So maybe, maybe Raul, there's old man strength. There might be young man hunger. You can cut as much weight as you want to. You can eat whatever you want to. Get away with it. I like the grappling out of Rosas, though. I must say, he has a handful on the mat when he is able to get it there. And you can tell just like what you had said. He's been doing this for a long time, too. And that's a wild thing to say about a kid who's only 17 years old because he does have such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the grappling side of things. And what we had said about Aliyev earlier on the card has to be said for Rosas, too. He's going to get better. At 17 years of age, we're not even looking at the canvas. We're window shopping for the painting supplies at this point so i think there is going to be a very successful career at one point it's just there sage north cup mickey gall there's so many fighters who get off to this chase really hooper shanae cooper exactly who get chase off to hooper. These, not chase jake Supers, hooper who get off to these really early starts don't look good and then they just sort of flare out we never hear from them again there's 15 fighters like that for every one song Yadong who actually like makes it to the top young and can look really good so Hopefully we just get a really good performance out of both these guys. Neither one is that concussive of a striker for being completely honest. So I'm not really expecting it to be a back and forth brawl. I do think if both guys get tired, we are going to result into much more of a grappling type of a fight between these two guys. So I-, I favor Rosas just for his grappling because I think that's how the fight's going to go. But this is a tough fight to pick just because of the age X factor, if you will. All right. So hopefully you learned a little bit about Raul Rosas Jr.'s last time out. Picked up the decision on Romando Gutierrez. Three 
3027s across the board, 11 minutes and 55 seconds of control time. Matt, I thought Mondo Gutierrez might even win that fight. I thought he had a really good chance. He was a good fighter, great amateur background. I think he was 7-1 before that fight. But he kept pulling for guillotines and giving the position to Rosas and then also getting taken down quite a bit. Which isn't great. But the thing about Rosas is he is a pretty good wrestler for his age. And that is the thing that you kind of have to say a lot because it is wild that an 18-year-old is in the UFC. Listen to an interview that Jay Perrin did with the All-Star MMA and, and JHK. And he hates that people have to consider Rosas that way. Like the old, oh, he's good for his age. You worry about an 18-year-old, though. Like, again, I brought this up in our previous prediction. Yeah. Like, Cyril gone. I didn't... I wasn't sold on him until he was in a hard fight. Do you think I think an 18-year-old can get into a war with Jay Perrin? No. I don't. I'm sorry. I just don't think he has the level of experience yet. Not only in fighting, but, like... I'm going to say like Robin Black. But in life, too, to actually be able to withstand some type of a fight like that. Like, you got to dig down deep to make it in a really difficult fight in MMA. Like, think about Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler, for instance. And think about anybody else in any other sport. Like, James Harden might have to run a pick and roll with a hurt hamstring. Michael Chandler had a flat nose that was leaking blood, and he was still, like, trying to knock out someone else. I don't know if Rosas Jr. is going to be able to get into that type of a fight against Jay Perrin. But Rosas is a good enough grappler to avoid a lot of the damaging strikes that potentially Jay Perrin's going to be able to hit him with. And I wonder how far that's going to be able to carry Rosas throughout the early parts of his UFC career. Because this is a wild person to quote, but I remember Eddie Bravo was talking about Tony Ferguson. He was just saying about bringing him into like 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. And I thought it was a really interesting perspective because he had said, yeah, when I get a striker who's now coming to Jiu-Jitsu, I might have him for a six month period. I might be in his corner. I'm not telling him to pull guillotine and like pull guard trying to work up triangles what i want to do is get him through that fight so i have another six months with him so i have another six months and then we can start to build on those skills with raul rosas jr it's going to take him a little bit of time to really start to develop the full set of well-rounded skills that he will need to start beating potential contenders in this bantamweight division but i think this is a good early fight for him against jay perrin because he offers very obvious difficulties on the feet with his combinations but if rosas is able to get the fight to the mat he should be able to be the much more controlling fight well and the quotable that i got out of that interview that Jay Perrin had with JHK was I mean the thing is that he's still a young man you know what I mean again he's going to grow up and be something crazy good and then further to it not a top caliber UFC fighter just yet so that kind of is it'd the, be wild if he was at 18 could you imagine but if you look at it for Rosas Jr and Perrin had kind of talked about it the fact that they had a couple of rounds to spar together but Rosas Jr. has kind of bounced around between gyms. He spent time at 10th Planet, at Syndicate. We threw it up there. Or I threw it up there. Lost Boys, Jiu-Jitsu, and Muay Thai. We've seen the Kosi brothers Do you like that there. for a young fighter kind of bouncing around early in their career? I don't mind it. Just trying to pick up as many skills as they like until they settle down. But I guess you could have different Jay, perspectives. Jay Perrin kind of said, like, Rosas would kind of hang out more with his brother and his dad. And they kind of, you know, spend time on their own in the gym training. I don't know. I've never been to the gym. So I, I don't know. You'd have to listen to that interview that Jay Perrin did. But when you look at it for Perrin, CES, Cage Titans, Bantamweight Champ. He was on Contender Series back in, uh, what was it, 2019. He fought Dwight Joseph. He lost by decision. A lot of people thought that he won that fight. It was the power of Joseph versus a lot of the volume and the good shots of Perrin. Perrin will get hit, and he doesn't really eat leg kicks all that well, but he is a pretty good striker in his own right. He is a good kind of slippery grappler in his own right. He's just a really well-rounded fighter. He's out of syndicate, training primarily with a guy who's cornered him in the past and Vince Morales, but also Ludwig Shalinian to get ready for this fight. And if Ludwig's anything, he's a wrestler. He so is. I think Ludwig is the perfect guy to train with for a fight like this because Ludwig's not going to offer up much on the feet, but he's just going to continue to try and take you down. So for Jay Perrin, getting ready for this fight, obviously it's interesting. He's a scrappy guy. His grandfather trained Irish Mickey Ward. They're always going to talk about that one. I know you love that one, but the pride of Lowell, Massachusetts. He used to train at a Sitya Tong, which is Mark Delagrati's gym, who really was a great, uh, what was it, The Mind of a Fighter book that I read with Sam Sheridan. There's a giant part from Mark Delagrati in that one, so pick that book up and give that one a read. But in this one, Rosas, power takedowns, really likes to get the back. He's really submission over position in a oh, lot yeah. of these spots, so we'll see how it plays out. And I look at him, I know he only has two inches of height and an inch of reach. He's probably the bigger fighter in this one, which is saying something for an 18-year-old fighter because he hasn't really grown into his body he just yet. A lot of weight, though. The odds in this one, Rosas open to minus 200, minus 217. Perrin open plus 170, plus 200. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise to us there to you. I'm going to say over under 85% Rosas Jr. I'll say under. 
And it's way over. 760 total votes. 93% Rosas Jr. 54% by decision. 33% by submission. For the 7% that Perrin, 65% by decision. I'm surprised this fight isn't somewhere closer to Perrin. I am too. But I have to go back to a theory that I bring up both the UFC a lot. They're a lot more like a lot of boxing organizations than we really realize. And they have a prospect who's 18 years old. Do you think they want him getting brutally finished on a pay-per-view undercard? No, they don't. I don't think they want to chase Hooper to do that either. It keeps happening. Uh, that's true, but it has worked out. Look at Song Yadong. He's had a very successful career. And I know for every positive example we bring up, we can bring up a negative example too. And that's why it's always so interesting because it does seem to happen. I brought this up earlier. She's happened, what, two times a year, I say? You've got a fighter that they sign who's 19 to 21 about. And it's, hey, we're going to throw them into the deep end. If they look really good, then we're going to have a really promising prospect on our hands. And if they don't, then it is really hard for them to kind of regain their composure and get back to a really good position. I ever so slightly think Rosas is going to be able to avoid the bigger shots of Jay Perrin get a lot of those takedowns. I don't think this is going to be a pretty fight, though, if I'm being completely honest. I don't think Rosas is going to do a submission. I do think this is going to go to uh, a decision. But I think overall, he is going to show that just the bigger guy physically and with his wrestling advantage that he should be able to win. Yeah, I think Jay Perrin has, obviously, the gifts on the feet to get the okay. win in this matchup. He's a much better striker. For Rosas, the only time we've seen him strike is when he strikes to get into the clinch to take guys down. And that was with, what, UWC when he was fighting in Mexico because he was under 17. And I'm assuming they didn't need a permission slip sign in Mexico. Just. I don't know how it works, but I know they did in Vegas when he fought on Contender Series when he was still 17. I like Rosas with the fact that I think he can chain the takedowns together. The thing that I said, though, in that video that kind of makes me hesitate a little is, what's his cardio like? We saw it against Gutierrez. It wasn't that bad, but we haven't really seen it tested all that much. Whereas for Perrin, he seems to be a cardio cane. He turns it on in the third rounds of his fight. So if you really do like Jay Perrin, make a good case down below in the comments section. Both of us going with Raul Rosas Jr. ever so slightly. I think it's going to be a great fight for what it's worth. And the next fight is Jarzino Rosenstrike and Chris Dacus. An amazing fight. banger at 265. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's, Let's get into it. it. Heavyweight Strikers set the pair up. UFC 282, we have Chris Dawkins looking to pick up the pieces for the Dawkins brothers after his brother Kyle's loss to Eric Anders last weekend at UFC Orlando. And he's taking on a guy in Jarzinho. Biggie boy Rosenstrike was on a two-fight losing streak. And Matt, I don't know why Panini decided. You don't know where I'm going with no. this one. To release a bunch of really cool cards, I like their immaculate cards. And I picked up a slick eBay find of a Rosenstrike. It's got like a piece of his trunks. Wow. It's got an autograph. They went with Jair Rosenstrike. Who the hell's calling him Jair Nobody. Rosenstrike? Not a single person. It's Jarzinho. But regardless of that, Matt, when I look at this matchup, both guys on two fight losing streaks. And for Chris Dawkins, he was on this meteoric rise coming into the UFC. Four straight knockout losses, kind of like Rosenstrike had as well. And for Rosenstrike, the, the fourth of the four... That was a big-time main event against Alistair Overeem where he was losing pillar to post until the last dying seconds of the fight. But for Dawkins, it was just quick knockout, quick knockout, beat Shamil Durkimov, and then they give him a main event against Derek Lewis about this time last year. And just every time he went to enter, he'd get countered, and then Good. Lewis started to move forward, dropped him, finished him. Then they gave Dawkins a main event in Columbus against Curtis Blades, and the whole time... The commentary was Curtis Blades got to wrestle. He's got to threaten with his wrestling. And Curtis Blades is a striker now. I don't know if you know that. But Blades looked really good with his boxing. And every time he hit Dawkins, same thing. He backed off. And then Blades was able to implement his game plan, ending up finishing him. So Dawkins had quite a bit of time off, getting ready for Biggie Boy. Biggie Boy's last two fights, loses to Curtis Blades by decision. Not much of a fun fight in a three-rounder. And his last time out, he took on Alexander Volkov. And some may say it was an early stoppage, but he did kind of land down hold up and he got hit herb dean ended the fight no sweat but out of that fight against volkov we didn't really get to see much out of rosenstrike either so both guys in a prove it to me fight that they really need coming up before the main card at 282 jersinho's power and his volume is like that song you know it's like rain on your wedding day because it's pretty i'm high. sorry just hold on if alanis morissette walks out and sings like you just did they're pulling the plug it's off the microphone. They're, they're pulling you the plug off the microphone and they're gonna say, I'm sorry, Miss oh, Morissette. They, they we have to rush into the hospital. Tickets. Here's the thing though. It's just pretty ironic how powerful the guy is, but he refuses to throw strikes whatsoever. Because that's the thing about Rosen Strike. He is such a dangerous fighter when he is in forward motion, throwing combinations. And he is a heavyweight who will 
both throw in combination. He's not a single strike striker, and I know a lot of his highlights are from the single strike, but they're primarily set up from the combination. Go back to his fight against Junior Albini. I know people like to make fun of Junior Albini because he looked like he wore a diaper in the UFC, but Jarzinho finished him from a 1-2 high kick, and that's not something we often see in the heavyweight division. So I do really like Rusev strike when he is moving forward and throwing with power, but it never happens ever. Like, you really have to pressure Jarzinho Rosenstrike to bring the fight out of him, and I gotta be honest, I thought he fought a pretty good fight against Curtis Blades. I know he lost, but he was able to land a couple good shots. He landed a big flying knee at one did, point that I thought would have wobbled Curtis Blades. Did Blades get taken it. down or held down? Exactly. The defense looked good, but you could just tell how tentative he was to throw his own strikes, and that's what I worry about in this matchup. If Jarzinho walks forward and throws punches, he's way more powerful than Chris Dawkins. He's way bigger than Chris Dawkins, too. And I know you might not think that, but Jarzinho is a pretty big heavyweight for the size of him. Big this way, he like is. large en français, but when you look at Rosenstrike, he's listed as 6'2 by the UFC. I don't believe he's six foot They're two. They're lying. So you're going to have a height advantage out of Chris Dacus. But the weird thing, this fight was originally booked on the October 1st card. Dern versus Jan, they rescheduled it to this one. But if you do look at it for both guys, the highs have been high for both of them. But for Dacus, it's a lot of walking forward, throwing his own combinations. And for Dacus, it's a lot of boxing. If you look at it in nine, or sorry, six UFC fights for Chris Dawkins, he's thrown nine leg kicks. He's not a kicker. And yeah, he's fought some wrestlers, but he's not a kicker. He yeah. really does get it done. And he's one of those guys that has really long arms and he has good extension, a good pop at the end of his shots. Good zip, as I like to say in some of these videos. But if you look at it for Dawkins, again, those last two fights, when he faced a little bit of the resistance, he'd back off and then he'd wait. And for Dawkins and Rosenstrike, they both do the exact same thing. They throw a lot of traps and a lot of feints out there. And until there's a finish, if there's a finish in this fight, the fans at T-Mobile are going to boo the F out of this. I do think Chris Dawkins is a faster starter, though. I think if there's a finish in the first round, it's probably because Chris Dawkins just marches forward and knocks out Rosenstrike. I really could see him just walking forward, jabbing twice, hitting him with a straight right, and that's kind of it for Rosenstrike. But on the flip side, if Rosenstrike is able to get his timing at all and implement his kicks, too, because like you had mentioned, Dawkins is a very boxing-heavy uh, MMA fighter. He will use his grappling a little bit. He does have defensive grappling, of course. I don't expect grappling to be a big factor in this matchup, though. If Curtis Blades couldn't take down Jarzinho Rosenstrike, I think Chris Dawkins is going to struggle with that. And Jarzinho is not much of a wrestler himself. But if Jarzinho is able to get his kicking game going at all, I think that's going to be really difficult for Chris Dawkins to deal with. But again, this fight is just whoever starts earlier is probably going to get the win. Because I don't think either guy can stand up to each other's power. But what I will say is, I think Rosenstrike is the faster fighter with his feet. He's pretty good at closing the distance when he decides to. And again, it is a big decision for him to make that commitment and try to close the distance but like we saw in the overing fight he was able to land that left hook from pretty far away and use his feet to close the distance and if he's able to do something like that against Chris Dawkins I would not be surprised well, whatsoever. And we saw Derek Lewis when he started to have success it was okay he's not inviting the fight from Dawkins and trying to counter he blitz forward and then out of the blitz Dawkins started to clinch up and that's really where it was the beginning of the end same thing Curtis Blade started to put the pressure on and Dawkins when he's backing up doesn't have as much success as when he's moving forward and very few fighters do but for Rosenstrike to me you can get it done both ways so I look at the odds here Rosenstrike open minus 160 minus 180 right now Dawkins plus 140 plus 145 150 we have a look at the topology vote surprise to us they already you I'm going to assume that Biggie Boy is favored by the fans as well. I'm going to say over under 75% Biggie Boy. I think it'll be under that, but it'll be the favorite. Panini's own Yar Rosenstrike. Yair, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's over 833 total votes, 79% Rosenstrike, 89% by knockout. For the 21%, maybe they confused Aukuses, 67% by knockout. I think Biggie Boy gets the win in this one, but again, if he's tentative, if his hands are down, Doc is the type of heavyweight that's really snappy, and when he blitzes on his own, look at what he was able to do to Abdurkimov in that exchange. So, Doc has been able to do it. The other win that I really like out of Doc that he has on his record, the Alexei Olenek one where he just, again, walked him down. He finished Nascimento, which doesn't happen all that often. Doc can definitely get it done, and if you pick him, I'm not going to slag you one bit. It's just to me, and I didn't really mention it, I like the kicks out of Rosenstrike as kind yeah, like of an added X factor in this fight. I agree 100%. I like Jarzinho because I think he is the more versatile striker. Like you had mentioned, he can move forward, move backwards. He does use his kicks. If it is a fight that's primarily fought in boxing range, though, Chris Dawkins can have a lot of success. His straight shots are probably going to land more often, but I think Jarzinho 
can eat more shots from Chris Dawkins than Chris Dawkins can eat from Biggie Boy. So I agree. I like Jairzinho in this. If you have one of the other 25 relic cards of Jairzinho Rosenstrike, or sorry, Yar Rosenstrike, he's got one of the smallest, weirdest little squiggles of an autograph I've ever seen. Let us know down below in the comments section. A big time fight coming up this weekend. Uh, Matt, Bryce Mitchell's taking on Ilya Topuria. I can't wait for it. Keep it locked in with Fight and Apex, we always say. Let's get into it. Coming up on the main card of UFC 282 at Featherweight, we have a couple of ranked guys in the number nine, Bryce Mitchell taking on number 14, Ilya Topuria, El Matador taking on Thug Nasty, an absolutely wild matchup because oh, yeah. if you look at Bryce Mitchell coming in off the Ultimate Fighter, he beats Tyler Diamond in a really close fight. Then he just kind of makes his way up through the division. But my God, the last two Bryce Mitchell fights, taking on Andre Feely, taking on Edson Barboza. If you told me two years ago that Bryce Mitchell was going to knock down Edson Barboza in the first round of their fight, A, I would have said, no, they're never going to fight each other. Like, they're worlds apart. But B... I would have said you're crazy, but those things happen. And Bryce Mitchell looked absolutely amazing against Edson Barboza in his last fight. And for Ilya Tapuria, if you told me he was going to fight up a weight class at 155, have a bit of a tough time on the scales in general, take on Jai Herbert and get knocked down by Jai Herbert, I would have said you're insane, but that also happened. He withstood that storm and he ended up finishing him as the fight went on. But Matt... This fight at 145 is absolute fireworks, and it has a lot to do with the division where you look down and Alex Caceres is ranked 15. So there's it's room wild. to move right now because there's inactivity all over the place, especially with your champ Alexander Volkanovsky moving up to take on Makachev at lightweight. So a lot of room to move for everybody here. The winner of this fight, you're just guaranteed a big fight after that. And again, I know you said it when we started this full card thing, if you're watching the full card video, but they're both undefeated. They both Wild. still feel like prospects. So this is a big, big fight for the career of both these guys. And you know what I love about this fight too? We knew we kind of mentioned on it. Both guys are way better at the kind of what you don't think about their game than you would automatically assume. Like Bryce Mitchell, you know how good of a grappler he is, how unorthodox of a grappler he is, and how aggressive he is with his wrestling and with his submission attempts. But you kind of get forget, or you kind of forget about how talented of a striker he is too. He's not a flashy striker by any means, but he's a good example of a guy who's a specialist that's been working on another part of his game in the background that we haven't seen because he's so good at his specialty. But now we know that if the fight is contested on the feet, I don't think Bryce Mitchell's going to go out there and completely outstrike Ilya Tapuria, but I don't now just assume he's going to lose every moment on the feet. No, like he offers up a different look, and I mean if you watch that fight, it was a right hook and then a straight left hand that dropped Barboza and then out of that, Mitchell didn't even have to attempt a takedown, it was right there on a silver platter. But what I will say though, Ilya Tapuria, again, to his credit, is a far better grappler than most people would assume, because when you watch his fighting style, yes, we see the overhands, the body shots, just how good he is on the feet with his boxing, but he's also a monster on the mat too. Now, the flip side is, like I said for Bryce Mitchell, can he have some success on the feet? Probably, but I don't love him to be there for the totality of this fight. The same thing has to be said for Tapuria. I think he is a good grappler. I don't think Bryce Mitchell's the guy you ever want to test your grappling against though, because Bryce Mitchell has fought black belts in the past. Charles Rose is a pretty good grappler. I know he's been out wrestled in the past. Bryce Mitchell made it look like he had never gone to a jiu-jitsu class in his life. He wrapped him up like a pretzel and no, he wasn't able to get the submission finish, but he threatened with about 17 twisters and had a body triangle on him for about 15 solid minutes. So I think Bryce Mitchell is... I won't say the more likely to get a submission. What I will say is the more likely to get control on the mat. I think if he gets on top of Ilya Tapuria, he is a big enough guy at this division and he's a strong enough wrestler to where I think he can hold that position at least for a few moments. And those are going to matter because I do think these guys are very closely contested across the board in MMA. And it's going to be really close to see, okay, who can win these small moments in different ranges? Because if it does go to a decision, I can see it being a fight where we get a lot of scrambles on the mat. Bryce Mitchell's going to have some good volume. Maybe Maybe Tapuria drops some of the shot along the way. Like, this is as good of a uh, non-championship fight, non-number one contender fight as you can possibly get. Again, the weight thing for Tapuria is really weird because he used to be a bantamweight. He missed bantamweight when he took on Breon Boulan at Cage Warriors 94. That was for the title. And he came in at 139.5. Now, he looked amazing in that fight. Took him down, submitted him. And he's looked amazing since then. But he's supposed to fight Charles Jordan back in June or January rather of this year. And he had weigh-in issues. Then he fought at... Uh, 
uh, lightweight against Jai Herbert. He was supposed to take on Edson Barboza back, uh, what was it, in October. That fight fell out, and ultimately he ends up with Bryce Mitchell. They had weird callouts, pictures below the belt, and it was just the oddest thing I've ever seen, or I guess it was above the belt. Wasn't it a picture of just straight abs? I don't know. It, it was the weirdest thing. It just... Like, two guys from complete opposite ends of the spectrum of the oh, world yeah. just calling each other out. And, Matt, when you do look at this matchup, the odds are fairly close. Mitchell open a plus 130 underdog, even though he's higher in the rankings. Both guys are undefeated. Tapuria open minus 150, still about there. But when I do look at this matchup, Matt, for Tapuria, he is just a Greco-Roman wrestler to the core. And that really was his kind of specialties. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt as well. But he has thunderous, powerful takedowns. And he likes to hold guys down quite a bit. Bryce Mitchell likes to go lower body. But he can work in his trips, his body locks as well. And he is also a very powerful grappler. So if we get those scrambles, like kind of the Tyler Diamond fight that we saw from the Ultimate Fighter or the finale, and so on and so forth, Bryce Mitchell can get into some of those wild exchanges. For Tapuria, We'll see how the gas tank plays out because, again, bantamweight, featherweight, lightweight, I worry about his gas tank no matter I, where and it Bryce is. Bryce Mitchell doesn't get tired and can fight at a crazy pace, too. Yeah, and we saw that even out of his last fight for Bryce Mitchell. But in the UFC, again, Bobby Moffat, Matt Sales, that twister win, uh, Rosa, Feely, like he just, he's like an energizer bunny in his fight. So I definitely think Tapuria has the, the better striking when it comes to this matchup. Oh, yeah. But for Bryce Mitchell, Matt, I'm going for a deep cut. From the, the vault of the albums. You're going to like this one. It's a Canadian. And he's the lead singer of Sticks now. And it's a song people aren't going to look for. But from the Strange Animal album of Gowan. He's got to keep the tension on. That's the song, Matt. Got to keep the tension on Tapuria. And not let him advance. And throw some of those boxing combinations. And the wildness that he can get into. Because his power is great. Oh yeah. If Tapuria can fight this fight with range. He's going to knock. Well okay. Probably. I. That's a stretch because Bryce Mitchell looks so good against Edson Barbosa. Barbosa is one of the best strikers we've ever seen in the UFC. So it's a stretch to say, oh, Tapuria is just going to flatline him. But I do think Tapuria is a much more heavy-handed striker and definitely at range. The thing is, though, Tapuria is going to get hit by Bryce Mitchell, too. And that'll be interesting to see. I just think both these guys are going to have a lot of success in the other fighter's wheelhouse. And I think that's going to make for a really interesting fight. I do like the pace, though, out of Bryce Mitchell in this matchup. And I really think that's going to be an important factor. Well, again, the odds. Bryce Mitchell's the underdog. Tapuri is the favorite. We have a look at those topology votes, Matt. Georgian MMA fans show up in droves for this stuff. And they're going to complain that we put Georgia in Spain, but those are the flags that he reps. So I'm just doing the guy justice. But representing Georgia is Ilya Tapuria. I'm going to assume that the fans have my topology. I'm going to say over under 62.5% Tapuria. I think under. I think it'll be close to 50. And it's slightly under. You've been good with these today. 804 total votes, 56% Tapuria, 65% by knockout. For the 44% that have Mitchell, 64% by decision, 26% by submission. Do you think Mitchell's going to win this fight? I like the underdog in this matchup, if I'm being completely honest. I see these odds at being very power. I cannot stress this enough. I think Mitchell's going to look better on the feet than people think, and I think Tapuria's going to look better on the mat than people expect. I think people expect him to look good on the mat. They do, but the problem is, if you only know him from his UFC tenure, you do not expect that part of his game whatsoever. However, you definitely go, expect it from yeah, Bryce Mitchell. Go, go watch the fights outside of the UFC from Ilya Tapuria if you want to see him succeed about, on the map. Yeah. Now, the thing is, though, I do think Mitchell's going to have more success if he gets on top of Ilya Tapuria. I think it's going to be difficult for Tapuria to try to sweep from that bottom position and get a lot of space from a guy like Mitchell because what Mitchell's so good at is he can get past your guard, past your half guard, without stacking, without creating a lot of separation. And that makes it really difficult for fighters to scramble out from underneath. So I do like Bryce Mitchell in this matchup, but this is such a good fight where the loser doesn't really lose stock. You know, both guys are going to be in the top 15 for a meaningful period of time. And I do worry about the weight from Tapuria, too. And the thing about Mitchell, like I mentioned, is if his X factor is his grappling, right behind it is his cardio. He can put a pace on guys that not a lot of fighters can keep up with. And that's why I think it'll be interesting to see Mitchell get into a five-round atmosphere with his fights. Because I do think his style, although aggressive, it could be catered towards a five-round fight. I think this is a closely Bra matched fight. Bryce Mitchell's one of those guys, like the two Hughes brothers. Like, he's just farm strong. He brings yeah. that into his fight. Like, Or if you're in New Brunswick, you could be farm strong, but you're probably wood strong. Like, anybody that works in the woods... I wouldn't double cross those guys at all. They beat the brakes off you. Doesn't matter if they're five foot nothing or seven feet tall. Or a flannel while they're doing it. They're wood strong. They're going to beat you up. But when it comes to a matchup like this, I, I really do like the striking of Tapodia. The only thing that I worry about is I see there's only an inch difference in the reach. 
Bryce Mitchell is a rangy type of striker, and he keeps his head off the center line when he does like to strike. He does pull back a little bit, though. I think it could get him caught against Tapuria. I do like the cardio advantage that I perceive that Bryce Mitchell does have, and his style is a little bit more conducive to winning decisions. So if you do like Bryce Mitchell as the underdog, I'm not going to fault you. Matt going with Mitchell. I like Tapuria in the matchup, but I think this is going to be an incredible fight on the main card. I mean, you've got Robbie Lawler taking on Ponzinibbio. you got that main event, Blahovich taking on Ank Live. You're not going to want to miss any of it. Keep locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. Big time middleweight banger on the main card of UFC 282. We have the Gorilla Darren Till taking on Still Knox, Drikus Duplessis, the former EFC welterweight middleweight champ, the former KSW champ, a man who has a win over Roberto Soldich. And that's not easy to do unless you kick him in the cup. Like it happened last week at one championship in his debut. But Matt, Fredericus Duplessis enters the UFC in 2020, picks up a big win, and he hasn't looked back. Beat Marcus Perez after withstanding an early storm. Beat Trevin Giles after withstanding an early storm. And his last time out had a fight of the night against Brad Tavares. And oh my goodness. Wow. It's crazy because for Duplessis, he attempted six takedowns, got none of them in the first round. In every Drikus Duplessis second round, this is it. He's breathing completely out of his mouth. Everybody thinks that he's tired. But the craziest part about it is even though he attempted all those takedowns, he didn't get them. First round, he lands 14 significant strikes. Second round, he lands 39. Third round, he lands 60. He had an uptick in volume. It's wild to see that out of a fighter after expending all of that energy. But Duplessis is just one of these weird anomalies at a Team CIT. His young teammate, 21 years old, Cameron Simon, competing on the undercard of this UFC 282 event. And Matt, for Darren Till, it's wild because he does still have a nice shiny record. I mean, it's what? 18-4-1. Oh, Started yeah. off his UFC tenure at 5-0-1. Since the title shot against Tyron Woodley, that was what? UFC 227. He's 1-4. and four. He's been finished in three of those four losses. And in his last time out, not that Drikus Duplessis fights anything like Derek Brunson, but in that fight, he had a little little bit of success with the hands but he got he got the dominated fight on the ground yeah, yeah he really got the fight beat out of him that Derek Brunson fight. so for like, Till we haven't really seen you know much in the last performance what I will say though is I don't think Duplessis can have the same level of wrestling that Derek Brunson did because Derek Brunson's a guy who we've mentioned this a lot like earlier on in his career he was known as that knockout artist he would come with a big storm hit you with that big straight left and guys couldn't withstand it but as his career has progressed his striking has probably regressed a little bit but he's definitely fallen back on his wrestling a lot and he is a talented wrestler Duplessis is a guy who can go for wrestling, but I do think that Darren Till, he is a good counter wrestler. I know he's not a great defensive grappler once the fight does hit the mat, but he's a difficult guy to get down in the first place, and normally it does take kind of that top tier wrestler to really be able to uh, implement their own grappling and get him down. Now, if Duplessis hits him with a big shot like we saw Tyron Woodley was able to do, and I could see Duplessis watching that Tyron Woodley fight and going back to it, because how did Tyron Woodley fight Darren Till? He walked backwards, he let Darren Till move forwards, and then he hit him with a big shot. Duplessis is much more likely to move forward in this situation, but he knows that, hey, if I crack him with a big shot, he doesn't necessarily make the best decisions while hurt, and Duplessis is a good enough grappler to where he could grab a submission, get one of those defensive guillotines. What I don't love out of Duplessis is, though, he does have one obvious weakness that Brad Tavares was able to take advantage of. Brad Tavares isn't a powerful puncher by any means, but he is a technical puncher who throws good straight shots, and he was able to land with consistency on Duplessis, especially earlier on in that fight. You could see a world where Darren Till is is able to move backwards, be able to counter him with that straight left, get in on the inside with the elbows. But this is such a sink or swim well, fight for Darren Till. Like, if he loses this, I don't genuinely know what the UFC is going to continue to do with him because he's been at the top for a very long time. I know he's still young in his career, like you had mentioned. He has a good record, and he's only lost to really good fighters. But he's gotten into the point now where when you book Darren Till, you can't really book him against just some Joe Blow off the street. You have to kind of give him these difficult matchups. Like, for Duplessis, he was 20 years old in 2004. 14 when he lost to Gareth McLennan and that was Gareth's step into the UFC to then lose to Bartosz Fabinski but for Duplessis he's been in the the minds he's been in the the the, the MMA fans minds for a very very long time in, international star is Drikus Duplessis and he attracts a lot of fans as it goes into fight week but when you look at it for Duplessis 
He likes the blitzes, and that doesn't work for hardly any fighter. But when he comes on with that storm, he lands a lot of power and a lot of volume. He is a good grappler, but sometimes it takes him quite a bit to get those takedowns. He has a wonky gas tank. But the biggest thing out of Duplessis, he has a really tall, high guard, and he leaves his body exposed a lot. Darren Till does have a good kick. For a guy like Darren Till, coming from that body kick, I mean, especially when he's in the southpaw stance, it opens up the liver, and you can see that against a guy like Duplessis, where he could get hurt to the body but for Darren Till his last win was at UFC 244 back in November of 2000 and what was that 19 so it's been a really long time also Edmund Shabazian's last win who's also on this card but if you look at it for Till he switched up his camp a lot lately now he used to be team Calbon which was Tom Aspinall Mike Grundy out of England and then he went to All-Stars before the fight with Brunson All-Stars after the fight with Brunson but for this fight he's been training at Tiger Muay Thai and also Bang Tao. So Bang Tao, he's been working out with Eric Spicely. Be nice if that brought some aggressiveness to his style. Eric Spicely aggressiveness? <laughs> no, not Eric Spicely. But just but, going to Bang Tao. That would be nice and, if we saw more moving and, forward Darren Till. So you have the Hickmans at Bang Tao. But at Tiger Muay Thai, he's been training with Marvin Vittori. And also, Sharapuddin Magomedov, the 16-0 and fighter over with RCC. That just gets tons and tons of finishes. And I saw somebody call him Blue Eyes White Dragon. That's not funny. But if you look at Magomedov... He's not a, a Yu-Gi-Oh fan? He's a... No, just... just We're going to forget that I said that. But go look him up. He is a wild fighter. But if you look at it for Darren Till, I do like the fact that he's training and striking there. Because you're going to have to get ready for that aggressiveness out of Drika Stuplessy. Till was due to fight Jack Hermanson this past summer. He fell out of that fight due to an injury. If you went over to his Instagram page, he showed his right knee getting drained, which was like, disgusting. That's my problem with Darren Till. He's reaching like the Clay Thompson, Paul George era with his injuries to where you start to get worried about how much like peak capacity Darren Till has left. Because every time you do stuff for a big injury, it might only take 1% away from you, but it takes a little bit away well, from you. And the weird thing, like you, like we said, he hasn't won since 2019. He's so had hand he, issues though, knee he, issues. He wins that fight back at UFC, you know, he beats Kelvin Gaston about four years ago. Then he fights Robert Whitaker, and it's a loss on his won, record. Man. That was a wild fight. It really was. And Till did have some successes in that one. And then he fights Brunson's primary wrestler. So style for style, this is this is a more winnable fight for Darren Till. 100%. Would you agree with me on this, though? For Duplessis, this is a good precursor to getting him towards the top of the division because you're going to start facing a lot more technical strikers. Alex Pereira is licking his lips if Duplessis ever comes up to him. Those wild blitzes do not work on levels of strikers to that degree. And that's what I do worry about with Duplessis. Like, he is an extremely entertaining fighter to watch. Like, you're always going to want to watch this guy fight. He's going to eat power shots. He's going to deliver power shots. He has good cardio. Like, he'll get stronger as the fight goes Weird on. Weird cardio. Weird cardio, you're right. But uh, we've seen in the he, UFC, he, at least, he has grown as the fight continues. It's and that's like, something you like. It's like a middleweight Justin Gaethje in that respect. Oh, no, exactly. And that's a good place to put him. But in the middleweight weight division again at the top like Robert Whitaker he's gonna time those blitzes and either take you down or kick you in the head Alex Pereira same thing Israel Adesanya like they are of that level Darren Till striking at one point was thought of as at that level but I just wonder how much has been taken away from him with the inactivity with him just not really having that once Darren Till confidence like Darren Till used to talk like Floyd Mayweather it was like hard work dedication stuff and now we just like I don't know. We've just, like, seen a bit of a shift in Darren Till, and I wonder if that's something he can get back, or if he's entered the stage that... Remember when Tyron Woodley just wouldn't throw punches anymore? Like, I wonder if we've reached that stage with Darren Till, because he hasn't looked like the same fighter who got himself to that title shot in the first place, and I think this is a great shot to get him back, to try to get him back to the fighter he was. Duplus C, the favorite, open minus 135, minus 170 or thereabouts. For Till, open plus 115, plus 135. It all depends on what Darren Till we get, really. Exactly. That's, that's the question. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Surprise to us there, to you. Duplus C is the favorite, and Till's 1-4 in his last five, so I'll say over, under... 67.5% Duplessis, because Till's a big fan favorite. And that's why I think they're going to be closer to 50-50, so I'll say under. Oh, 867 total votes, 68% Duplessis, 23% by decision, 61% by knockout. For the 32% that have Till, 58% by decision, 34% by knockout. I think if Till gets a win, I think he get. I think he could knock out oh, Duplessis. It's been it's been done before. Obviously, McClellan's got this the finish win over Duplessis, but as well, Roberto Soldich. And Soldich is so good counter-striking, but also moving forward as well. And if you look at it for Till, he possesses some of those same skills. Now, I'd love to see Soldich fight Till, but it will never happen because one championship has that stranglehold. But if you do look at it for Till, 
I'm eager to see what wrinkles he's able to add to his game plan from training at Bang Tao as well as Tiger Muay Thai. Pot and popcorn for me. I'm really eager to see this one. I have Duplessy ever so slightly just because I've seen the continued, not progression, but I've seen him continue to work his game plan into yeah. some of these fights that are similar to a fight against Till. But the thing that I like too, he's a good enough counter striker on the back foot like we saw against Trevin Giles, like we saw with him over at the FC and KSW to where I think he can win this fight. But again, high guard opens up the body and I would think that they're going to try and work that in the Till corner. I think Duplessis going to have to be really aggressive in this fight. And that's why I do have him in the matchup. But that's going to open up the window for Jared Till to land one of those big counter shots. I think it will be a very tense fight. There's some fights that oh. you're watching where maybe not a lot's it's, happening, it's, but you're always worried that the next shot could be the last. This is going to be one of those fights, but I also have Drikas Duplessis. It's going to be one of those Louis Smolka fights, puckering your butt exactly. Just getting ready for it, Matt. Both of us going with South Africa. Still not Drikas Duplessis to get the win. I can't wait for this one. Let us know down below if you have Duplessis or Till. You're not wrong until Saturday night. It should be a great one. And a big time fight coming up next. Robbie Lawler against Santiago Ponzinibbio. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, we always say. Let's get into it. Coming up this weekend, a possible fight of the oh, night yeah. at welterweight. We have a couple of legends of the welterweight division. Robbie Lawler, the former champ, the strike force great, entered the UFC, Matt, when you were very, very young, and yeah. I was also very young. But for Lawler, it's been one of the most storied careers in MMA history. Actually. He's a Hall of Famer to the caliber of Rafael Dos Anjos, who got the win against Brian Barberina his last time out, which makes Lawler's last fight age kind of oddly. But not really because they both struck. But if you look at it for Santiago Ponzinibbio on the wrong end of a couple of split decision losses his last two times out. One against Jeff Neal, one against Michelle Pereira. So he looks to reset against Robbie Lawler. But a couple of guys that are primary strikers, but we'll mix it up with the grappling a little bit as well. I don't think we're seeing any grappling in this matchup though. Uh, Robbie Lawler hasn't been a wrestler in a meaningful period of time. Like We have not seen him shoot for takedowns in ever. Like, it's been years and years and years and years and years. But, he is a good counter wrestler, though, but he is one of these guys like Chuck Liddell or like a Justin Gage who primarily use their wrestling as a defensive tool to then open up their own kickboxing. That's the thing about Robbie Lawler. One of the dirtiest kickboxers, and I mean that as a compliment, not like a mean way. Like, his kickboxing in his prime was insane. He would throw leg kicks, he could throw overhands, he was technical, but he could also brawl, and that makes for a fan-friendly fighter, which everybody's always going to love, but he was good enough to get to a title shot, win a title, and then hold that title for multiple defenses, so that tells you just how technical Robbie Lawler can be when he is at his best, but the problem is, at 40 years of age, he still fights like he did when he was 30, when he was 25, when he was 20, and at 40, he can't really eat the shots that he could in the Carlos Condit fight and the Rory McDonald fight, even in the two Johnny Hendricks fights. Like, people might scoff at Johnny Hendricks now, but Johnny Hendricks in his prime was an MF for to deal Did with. Did he beat GSP? Probably. But Robbie Lawler went out there and had two amazing fights with Hendricks. Lost the first, won the second one. But Prime Lawler, we're far removed from that time. And I know he went out there and had a very entertaining fight with Brian Barberena. And he bit down on the mouthpiece and probably looked as good as he possibly could in that fight. I just wonder how many more of those Robbie Lawler has left in the tank. Because we saw him go in there and try to fight with this classic aggressive style that, to be fair, we hadn't even really seen him fight like that in a little bit. Like, no, he did against Nick Diaz. Uh, he did against Nick Diaz, but Nick Diaz hadn't fought in, what, 10 years? So getting a win over him doesn't make me completely sold on you. Look at the Robbie Lawler who fought, like, Michael Chiesa, though. Like, he gets grounded out, he gets out-wrestled, he's not all that aggressive. Like, the Colby Covington one, too, and I know Covington's one of the better fighters in the division, but still, he was tentative in that fight. I know he got better as the fight went on, but still, we hadn't seen the aggressive Robbie Lawler that we had seen in the Barbarina fight for a few performances, but he looked really good up until he didn't. And I just wonder if he can go in there and try to have that kind of a fight with Ponzinibbio. The one thing I do like about Lawler is, even at this stage of his career, he's probably the more active out of the two. Ponsonibio is going to try to wait, set up his right hand, left hook. It's a combination he really likes to throw. I just keep on coming back to how many more of these fights can Lawler get into? Because a guy like... I'm trying to think. A guy like Jose Aldo can age somewhat gracefully because he might have got knocked out a few times throughout his career, but think about a Jose Aldo fight. He's going to land his own combinations. He's pretty good defensively, keeps the hands up. Lawler doesn't fight like that. Lawler is going to eat some well, big shots. Lawler's big trouble that he has as of late, and again, it's been a lot of the wrestling. The Colby Covington fight, the fight against Dos Anjos for a bit of it, the fight that he had against Neil Magny, against Chiesa you're taking on guys that are going to try and take you down later on in your career. And for Lawler, he's been a long time staple of 
Hard Knocks, Sanford, Killcliffe SC. Oh, yeah. He's been there for a really, he really was with long ATT time. Before that. And Ponzinibbio has been a long time ATT guy. So there's going to be some familiarity there. But if you do look at it for Ponzinibbio, he had those life altering medical issues. Before that, that big win over Neil Magny. So MMA math says that Ponzinibbio wins. But he took all the time off. And then he fight, fought Li Jingliang. And he got knocked out. Yeah, he got knocked out. And then he went out there and he picks up a big win over Miguel Baeza. It's a fight in the night. It was a good one. Good decision win there. Loses to Jeff Neal, but there are some positives in that one. Loses to Michelle Pereira. But the nice thing that you've seen out of Ponzinibbio in those last two fights, fight in the night or not, is the fact that he still moves well side to side. He still cuts the cage in his own right. And like you said, right hand, left ja- or left hook. He's really able to cut the fighter off and then press forward with his own offense and mix together his boxing combinations. I like the leg kicks. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it, it does open things up too with his leg kicks. And for Robbie Lawler, the trouble, being the southpaw that he is, his defense is kind of odd because he's one of those guys that'll throw up that lead arm and then play around it. And it doesn't work sometimes against some of these guys that will throw in combination against them. Like a Barbarina was able, able to have success. In, in 2014 though, if you saw this well. man coming towards you, it was the scariest thing imaginable. And then he's coming with the uppercut. Because, like, Robbie prime Robbie Lawler. Lawler, yeah, never got tired. You could hit him with a sledgehammer and he didn't go down. And he had, like, bricks in his own hands. It was terrifying. I do think the light kicks of Ponzinibbio are going to be a big factor in this fight, though. Because Lawler, throughout his career, has never really checked light kicks. I always remember that crazy highlight that he has over Melvin Manhoof where he lands that overhand. How do we Straight get to that course, position, man. though? He gets light kicked 78 times by Melvin Manhoof to where his front leg is basically dead. I could see Ponzinibbio having a lot of that same success with those techniques. He's not going to put as much power behind it as Manhoof could, of course. But Ponzinibbio does, uh, he can fight in that technical manner on the outside. Again, I do give the volume edge to Robbie Lawler, though. So maybe if he is able to make it an ugly fight, get into some dirty boxing exchanges, use his clinch, because he does like those uppercuts on the inside. I think that could be a big factor for him. I could see him having success, but the thing about Ponzinibbio is he has eaten some big shots his last two fights. I was worried about his chin after the long layoff fight in Li Jingliang who is a good power puncher in his own right. It's not like you get knocked out by the leech and all of a sudden you can't take a punch but I was worried about how Ponzinibbio was going to respond after that but against Baeza that was a tough fight like you said. Fight of the night. You don't get a fight of the night without eating some big shots and he was able to eat shots from a guy like Jeff Neal who we just saw knock out Vicente Luque who had never been stopped in his career. the Jeff Neal fight if people will remember it Ponzinibbio had a lot of favor going into that one because he came off the Baeza win. Neal was coming off the loss to Thompson where he looked fairly flat like he was he chasing did. he wasn't able to do much but that looked like the Neil of old his footwork was great on the outside he was throwing in combinations picking his shots and his defenses were really good so that's a credit to Jeff Neal but on the flip side it's also a credit to Ponzinibbio at the same time like I said cutting the cage cutting angles throwing those leg kicks and really throwing good boxing combinations and against Pereira who just moves like a wild man on the outside, it can be really tricky to kind of pin him down and figure him out. So against a guy like Robbie Lawler, Lawler's always going to push a pace. He's going to throw great combinations, kind of like a Michael Johnson who he trains with. The power is still pretty well there. He still throws good volume, but for Lawler, the difference is he doesn't really take the shots as well as a guy like Johnson still can somehow having like a 500 record. So if we look at the odds in this matchup, Matt, Ponzinibbio open minus 400. Minus 415 favorite. Lawler open plus 330. He's still a giant underdog. We have a look at the topology vote. Surprise us there to you. I'm going to say over under 80% Ponzinibbio just based off of the odds. I think they'll be over. They're, they're over. 913 total votes. 90% Ponzinibbio. 23% by decision. 68% by knockout for the 10% that have Lawler. 53% by knockout. I think if Lawler wins, he wins a decision. And I don't think it's completely outside of the realm of possibility. I don't, and I'm not trying to play MMA math, but, like, these three fighters all fight in a similar manner. If Ponzinibbio fought Brian Barberina tomorrow, I would pick Ponzinibbio and not think twice about it. Robbie Lawler just got knocked out by Brian Barberina, who doesn't hit nearly as hard as Santiago does. He throws more punches. I will give him that credit. He's more likely to engage in that type of a brawl. But still, Barberina is not the technical fighter that Ponzinibbio can be. And I think if Ponzinibbio gets Lawler hurt, we saw what happened when Barberina got him hurt. The second he did, Lawler went up against the cage. Barberina was able to unload with the combination. Ponzinibbio can do that exact same thing if he's able to hurt Lawler. It's unfortunate that this is, like, 
what's probably going to happen to Robbie Lawler. Like, I don't want to see this happen. But Ponce de is a pretty good fighter to be on a two-fight losing streak. He might not be the guy that he once was. I genuinely thought he was going to beat Kamaru Usman when Kamaru Usman ended up fighting Damian Maya. That was a big hot take of mine. I know Ponce de was a big underdog going into that, but that's how highly I thought of him at one point, kind of in the prime of his career. But I do think we are past that. I still think it's enough to beat Robbie Lawler, though. Both of us going with Santiago Ponce de in the matchup. Let us know down below if you have the former Strike Force great, UFC great, future Hall of Famer Robbie Lawler in this fight. Or if you have the Spanish language broadcaster Ponzinibbio, the Argentine dagger, a great late career nickname change. I'll give credit when it's due when a nickname is great and he's got a pretty darn good one. We have two big time fights left on this card. You're not going to want to miss any of it. Let's keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. We always say, let's get into it. UFC 282 in the lightweight division. A couple of guys looking to make moves and start groups. Before they knew we were gone and make a move into the rankings, we have Patty the Batty Pimblet, whose dog might take a sloppy sh on your yard. You better watch He'll out be a for gentleman it. about it, though. He will. He'll tell you, and then it'll go viral. He's taking on Jared Flash Gordon, a guy who is incredibly well-rounded and on a tidy little run. He did face a bit of a blip, his second-to-last fight out against a forever prospect in Grant Dawson, but for Gordon, picked up the pieces, beat an all-time ledge in Leonardo Santos's last time out, and for Gordon versus some of the guys that Pimblet's faced so far in the UFC, if we break it down, Luigi Vendramini did catch him a little bit, but he ends up finishing him. The next guy out, Kazula Vargas, who caught him. Does catch him. But then Pimblet was able to get him out of there. And then Pimblet against Jordan Levitt. There wasn't a whole heck of a lot of resistance in that fight. Pimblet's now taking on another one of those well-rounded type of guys. Gordon can get it done in the striking. If you try and mess with him out on the streets, you're going to get taken down and finished. Well. But Gordon has really kind of won out since he was facing guys like Charles Oliveira a few years ago. That is the weird thing about Jared Gordon. He's in a very specific category of fighter to where he's a prospect's first really difficult fight or is your last fight in the UFC on your way out? And that's pretty much his level of competition throughout his UFC. Because there's been a lot of guys. Hakron Diaz is an example I always go back to. Like, a guy who was decent in his prime. But by the time he fought Jared Gordon, was well past it. So for Gordon, I do find it hard to get a real, uh, just adjustment on how good he is in the division. Because he has had this late career resurgence. And it does seem like he's made improvements since the earlier blunders that we did see. Because he's one of those well-rounded fighters. And well-rounded fighters always operate on a very fine line. You're either well-rounded... To where you're going to struggle every time you fight a specialist. Like, you're good enough at wrestling, but if someone has great takedown defense and really good striking, they're always going to beat you. But I do think Gordon's cardio is able to carry him past and really be able to weaponize his well-roundedness. And I do think his cardio is going to be his biggest asset in this fight against Patty Pimblett. Because when I think about how Jared Gordon's probably going to fight this fight, it's pressure him forward, use the clinch, really wear on him and make it an ugly fight. Because Gordon is a good offensive wrestler. We have seen him struggle in a few positions defensively with his grappling, but he's a big guy for the division too, even at lightweight. I know he was a former featherweight who then moved up, but he is a bigger guy and a real physical guy for this weight division too. And I think it's an interesting skill check for a guy like Patty Pimblett, but it's weird. I don't think Patty Pimblett's going to get the respect he probably deserves for beating Jared Gordon. Like, Patty Pimblett's a pretty big name. He's the co-main event of a pay-per-view, so, like, people know who he is. And Jordan's a really difficult, or Gordon, sorry, is a really difficult test for a lot of fighters because he is so well-rounded. He can take a big shot. He can weaponize his cardio. So, for Pimblett, even if he does get the win, I don't feel like this will be the stock-boosting thing that the UFC might think it is. If you look at it for Pimblett, he holds an advantage here, and it's not a technique advantage. It's not some type of skill that he possesses. It's the fact that he has the advantage of hindsight. And that's because his main teammate and a guy that he cornered in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada, Chris Fishgold, the former Cage Warriors featherweight champ, actually has a loss to Jared Gordon. So next generation, uh, Liverpool, they're going to be able to pool together, look back at that fight, see where Fishgold had some deficiencies in that one, and help out Patty Pimblett game planning in a fight against Gordon. Now, Gordon, to his credit, like you said, He's gotten even better since that fight that he had against Fishgold. And the only zig that I would zag to in his overall record, the split decision win that he has against Joe Selecki. That's a guy that wasn't on his way out and, and not one of those prospects. Like, But he's I, a prospect who not a lot of people think highly of Joe Selecki right I now. I think a lot of people think highly of Joe Selecki. Maybe I'm the only one. Yeah, but regardless, I don't think, Joe I think Jared Gordon, since his CFFC days, even though he was at the top of the mountain there, he's continued to get better. Even at 34 years of age, he's better than the fighter that came into the UFC, whereas Patty Pimblett was the guy that kind of 
bucked the UFC away for a while, didn't want that shot, continued to get it done over with Cage Warriors. And for Gordon, obviously wants to take the back like Sorenbach was able to do and get a submission just like that. And that was Pimblet's last loss. But some challenges for Pimblet on the way up, some challenges even in the UFC. But we've seen an increase for Pimblet in his striking that we didn't necessarily see when he was with Cage Warriors. An uptick in the power, too, and the amount that he's kind of sat down on some of these shots. It is nice to see because he's a very rangy guy for the weight division. And with his grappling in his back pocket, if he has an answer for you at the long range, that means you're going to have to get on the inside for Patty Pimblett. You're falling into his trap at that point because then he can start using his wrestling. It is a nice thing to add to his game because some MMA fighters will add a wrinkle to their game. But it goes unnoticed. It's not really something or an area that they really go to. But when he did add these longer range strikes to his repertoire to where you really have to respect the distance striking of Pimblet, it then does open up the grappling of his own game. And that's why I think this is a difficult matchup for Jared Gordon because I think Gordon's going to have to go for the takedown in this fight to have success. I think on the feet, he can make it a gritty fight. Maybe if he does get it on the inside, use a lot of clinch. Maybe he can have success. But I gotta be honest, on the mat, I don't think Jared Gordon's that much better than Jordan Levitt. Like, Jordan Levitt's a really good grappler in this division. I know he might not be the most well-rounded fighter, he might not be your favorite fighter, but he's a really good wrestler and he's a great grappler. And Patty Pimblett was able to cut through him like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, he so might be your favorite twerker. He might, but you know what I mean? Like, for Jared Gordon to have success, he's probably gonna have to fight in a manner that we saw Jordan Levitt try to do. Levitt is really good at that one area of his game, and he offered little to no resistance to Patty Pimblett. I just think Pimblett, with his grappling, he's much more finish-oriented than a guy like Jared Gordon. To me, and I, if I just focus on the sample size in the UFC, and I look away from the Cage Warriors fights, because for Pimblett over with Cage Warriors after the Bach fight, the Decky Dalton fight was on somewhat a short notice, David Martinez wasn't on the same level, so I don't really classify those ones and then the other ones like Alexi Manikivi go back and watch that one the flying triangle win that he has like he looks like Demetrius Johnson with his grappling in that one but for Gordon focus on Benjamini I like Benjamini I like that he's a oh, powerful yeah. grappler he's a powerful striker Jared Gordon's a more complete product than that, and he's better than Benjamini in a lot of those positions. Look at Kazula Vargas. Kazula Vargas might have more power, but Jared Gordon is a much more complete fighter than that. And look at Jordan Levitt. Is Levitt maybe a more powerful grappler? Sure. Jared Gordon's better than Jordan Levitt. So for Gordon, this, again, is another really, really tough skill test, a tough skill check. And if you look at the odds, Pimblet open plus 125, minus 225 the favorite now. Gordon open minus one. 45 plus 182 or thereabouts on best fight odds. We have a look at the topology votes, Matt. Now, they're surprised us there to you, but I don't assume they're all that close because Patty Pimblett is that guy right yeah. now. I'm going to say over, under. I'm, I think I'm going to make it tough on you. 90% Pimblett. Uh, over. I think it's going to be over. It's under. 869 total votes, 88% Pimblett, 15% by decision. 62% by submission, 16% by knockout for the 12% that I'm Gordon, 82% by decision. The one X factor that I like out of Jared Gordon, doesn't matter if he's 34, if he's 28, he's got good cardio. Oh, he, he really does. does. You look at his last fight against my guy, Leo Santos. If you're new to the channel, he's 43. I've always been on Leonardo Santos. I think he was always just one of those sneaky guys that didn't fight enough. But for Jared Gordon, he just continued to apply the pressure, and he looked really, really good in that fight. He's got the stick to in his fights, and if he gets hit by a big shot of Pimblet, he can kind of get the wherewithal to get back into a fight. But I think Pimblet, it's just the consistent, continued attacks and the variety of attacks that he's able to throw at a guy like Gordon. I like his grappling, his jiu-jitsu, and the fact that he started to kind of sit down on those shots as a reason why I think he can get the win over Gordon. I think Gordon could win a decision, but that would be the only way. I don't think he can get a finish. He's an okay enough striker, but he's not the most heavy-handed. He's a good grappler, but he does really rely on his kind of cardio and his grit and grind and his wrestling more than his kind of lights out jujitsu, if you will. So if it ends inside the distance without a doubt, Patty Pimblett, that's why I do like him in this fight. I do think he is the much more damaging fighter, whether it be with his grappling or with his striking, but it's another good step up for Patty Pimblett. I will say this, the UFC is building him in a way that's going to make him better over time. You might want him to fight a guy who's in the top 15 right now, but I like how you broke it down. You said, oh, Jared Gordon, is he as good of a pure striker as Kazulu Vargas? Maybe not, but he's definitely more well-rounded. Is he as good of a grappler as Jordan Levitt? No, but again, he's more well-rounded. He really is kind of a combination of all the UFC tests that Patty Pimblett has had up until this point. And it's okay. You beat Jared Gordon. 
Is it Jim Miller next? Is it a guy who's maybe on his way out of the top 15? You don't know, but it's a good fighter is next. That's all you know. You can't go from Jared Gordon and then go back to fighting guys like Kazulu Vargas. So I think this will be a really important step up for Patty Pimblett. And this might be, it's wild to say, but the most important fight of his UFC career. Winner gets the most called out fighter in UFC lightweight history who's not from Ireland. They get a guy out of New York. They call out Gregor Gillespie, the gift, Matt. Both of us in this fight going with the baddie, Patty. Pimblet to get the win. Let us know down below in the comment section who you have. A big time main event for the title up at the top. Jan Blahovic taking on Magomed Ankalaev. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks. We always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Your new main event for UFC 282, November 23rd. It was announced that Yuri Prohoshka was out of his boat against Glover Teixeira. And from three rounds originally between Jan Blahovic and Magomed Ankalaev, it would be a five-round main event for the title that Blahovic once held not that long ago. We have Poland's Blahovic taking on... The now, I mean, listen, he's on an absolute heater. Magomed Ankalaev, an absolute win streak. And I was going to say undefeated, but he had that last second Hail Mary loss to Paul Craig in his UFC debut. Since then, a wild win streak for Ankalaev. List you the names. Prakniao, Abreu, Lunchambula, Kutsalaba twice, Krilov, Uzdemir, Santos, and Anthony Smith's last time out, and he beat him down. So yeah. now Ankalaev gets to test himself against the former champ and Blahovic. And for Blahovic... Like, this is a guy that's from the opposite end of the spectrum. Whereas Ankalaev's one and one and one and lost one time, oh, barely. Bet. Blahovic started off his UFC career on a not-so-great turn and then became the most unlikely of champions. Craig's gonna roll his eyes right now. I think Jan Blahovic is a fighter who can look good in a loss, and Ankalaev can look bad in a win. And I do think that they have shown that in their UFC tenures. I always go back to when Jan Blahovic fought Alexander Gustafsson, and I really was down on the UFC for not bringing up that performance more when he fought... Uh, Israel Adesanya, and this is why. I know that's wild. Jan Blahovic lit Alexander Gustafsson up on the feet. Gustafsson had to take him down round after round after round because he couldn't deal with the kickboxing of Jan Blahovic. Isn't that something we should probably talk about? That Jan Blahovic was able to outstrike a prime Gustafsson? And maybe Gustafsson was a little bit past his prime at that point, but you get the idea. He forced a guy who was at one point thought of as one of the best in the division's history, and he forced him to go to his plan B and really struggle with that part of his game. I just think Jan Blahovic is one of these guys who, we bring this up, there's some fighters who are never going to get the respect they deserve from the odds makers. They're always going to be a bigger underdog than they probably deserve to be. Jan Blahovic was like a 3-1 to one underdog when he fought Dominic Reyes, and it's just, it's one of those things where Jan Blahovic, he just looks like a guy, you know, like he's a big powerful puncher, but he doesn't do anything all that well to make you really wow. Like he's a technical striker. He has good punching power, but nothing is really in that like one percentile that makes him stand out like a Francis Ngannou. But I do feel like at this stage of his career, he's been able to show that he is very well-rounded. And I hate that Ally Aquinta is my example for this. So I think we're going to make Jan Blahovic the new example because Jan Blahovic, at least up until this point, has demonstrated if you're a really good striker, well, he's a good enough wrestler to take you down and really implement that part of his game. And if you're a really good wrestler, well, Jan Blahovic has pretty good takedown defense, and we all know how talented of a striker he is. I just think this is a really competitive fight, because I think Mega Man Ankalaev is looked at as that, like, new shiny sports car, whereas Jan Blahovic is kind of that truck that might look like it's beaten up, but it's going to get you from point A to point B. The kid's a super duty. You look at Blahovic, though, he was a plus 205 underdog in that fight against Dominic Reyes, but from the flip side of the coin, you say he doesn't get the respect. He's minus 265 in his title defense against Glover Teixeira. But Glover was 40. And he lost that belt. No, no, I know. But going into that fight, not a lot of people thought and, that Glover was going to put on the performance he did. We should say this. Frank Alive, like, it was, okay, when is he going to get his title shot? And like you said, he's had some fights that were kind of blase. The Santos fight, fight wasn't great. The fight against Santos wasn't great. The fight against Uzdemir wasn't great. Like, Uzdemir had some successes in that matchup. And then if you look at his last win over Anthony Smith, who's always in main events, finally Ankalaya probably getting the respect he deserves. Now, originally this fight was more than likely a title eliminator because exactly. you're supposed to have to share in Prohoshka in the marquee. And for Blahovic, not that he doesn't deserve to fight for the belt because you thought maybe he'd get a rematch against Teixeira after he lost, but he lost so convincingly. He fights Alexander Rakic, and it's ended quickly due to that leg injury. He looked good up until the point, though, I'd He say. did look good up until that point. It's just unfortunate the way that that fight went. So it would have been great if this was a title eliminator. You would have had some more clarity uh, going into a title fight, but ultimately we get this matchup. So what do these guys do really well if you've never seen them fight before? For Ankalaev, distance striking and mixing his kicks to all three levels and he's a light heavyweight that can do that like no other look at his fight against Dolce Linjambula you know what we talked about a lot in the Adesanya fight 
Jan Blachowicz checks leg kicks like nobody else in the UFC. He not only checks leg kicks, he can check body kicks. He's one of the few fighters who does body kicks the right way. They teach you to block body kicks, elbow to knee, and then you create the shield. Jan Blachowicz can hurt you with his defense. And that's what I do like about Jan Blachowicz. And that's why the Tiago Santos loss was very telling for Blachowicz. Because when he is a technical striker who fights within himself, when Jan Blachowicz knows who he is, he is an mf to deal with. But we saw what happened in the Santos fight. He got a little over aggressive. It was the Tiago Santos who wasn't moving forward and he got caught by a big shot. Fought a little bit like Drikas Dupas in that fight. A little bit, but the thing about Ankalaev is it's going to be really interesting to see how he fights this fight because I think if he shows up like he did against Kutalaba the second time around just trying to knock out Jan Blahovic, it's a terrible idea. Like, Jan Blahovic has a really good chin. He's proven that on multiple occasions. He has phenomenal cardio for a power puncher too and he's been in five round atmospheres before and you don't worry about his cardio falling off a cliff and that's the thing I will say about both these guys. I don't think the five round difference is going to make that big of a change to the quality of fight that we're going to see because neither guy fights at such a high pace to where you worry about them tiring themselves out. They really go for their explosions once they are set up behind either kicks or feints or what have you on the outside. So I think this fight will be fought at a pretty good pace for as long as it is. I think both guys have a pretty good chin and I do think stylistically it's going to make for a fun fight because neither guy really has that one area that they're going to have a huge advantage in. Like Ankoliyev might have slightly better offensive kicks from the outside but Jan Blahovic is like a dirty boxer on the inside he's also really good at that so I think both guys have those small areas that they can excel in but for the most part they are similar fighters and this is the undisputed belt like this is the one that John Jones is supposed to hold to the end of time and it's not happening so it's changed hands quite a few times we'll see if Blahovic can get the belt back or if it goes to Ankalaev now the main event and the five round experience definitely goes to Jan Blahovic in a matchup like this he's trained for more five round fights Ankalaev has the big fights that he had outside of the UFC not necessarily five rounders but he did have the five rounder against Thiago Santos and he was incredibly reserved in that fight so we'll see how that plays out for both of these guys when they game plan for a matchup like this because for Blahovic, I mean out of what is it WCA over in Poland a great team around him for Ankolaev out of his native uh country but if you do look at it for these two guys I mean the height the reach Pretty similar. The reach actually lies uh, towards Blahovich in a matchup like this, which might surprise some people if they're not just looking at the graphic. If you look at the odds in this fight, and we will have a quick look at them in the old handy dandy notes, Blahovich is the underdog, open plus 170, plus 200 right now. Ankalaev open minus 200, minus 250. We have a look at the topology votes. Surprise to us, they are to you. Listen, Ankalaev has been the uncrowned champ for a long time. So I'm going to say over under 75% Ankalaev. It'll probably be over. That's under. Uh, 884 total votes, 73% Ankalaev, 64% by decision, 22% by knockout. I think you get an Ankalaev decision, it's probably a boring fight. For the 27% that have Blahovic, 40% by decision, 46% by knockout. My question is, Matt, does Ankalaev go for any offensive takedowns? Is he forced to do it if he loses in the striking? That's the thing. And will Blahovic be able to dictate the pace of this fight? Uh, Blahovic only has one weakness in this game. I know I give him his flowers for how well-rounded he is. You can hold him down if you do get on top of him. He has good takedown defense, but it's very much kind of like good takedown defense, good first move off the momentum, but you can hold him on his back. Again, if Alexander Gustafsson can use his offensive wrestling against you, the Mega Man Ankoliev certainly can, but it will be interesting because I could see that wearing on Ankoliev, especially if he does use his wrestling early. And Blahovic, like I said, he doesn't fight at such a high pace to where you're like, wow, I'm worried he's going to punch himself out in the fourth and fifth round he does fight in a reserve manner and he makes his punches count we saw that in the dominic reyes fight he threw 17 punches in the two rounds that fight happened but every single one of them landed and every single one of them like it had an effect on dominic reyes's face and that was a very different dominic reyes than the one that we've seen lately like that was a really good fighter that he beat in that fight i love the odds for where dominic or sorry for jan blahovic in this matchup because i do think that ank alive is one of his more favorable matchups in the top five at this stage of his career but he is 39 years old going on 30 like we're starting to see the end for Jan Blahovic. And I know that a 205 did heavyweight fighters can hold on for a little bit longer. We've seen it. Power's the last thing, the last thing to go. And in these two weight classes, power is normally the most important thing. So I could see a world where Jan Blahovic triumphantly returns, shows off that Polish power, and gets a win over Ankalaev. But I think the range management of Ankalaev, his 
just risk adverse style is going to help him in this fight. I do tend to agree with you. I could see it being a little bit boring, which you hate to say for a five round title fight, but Angelaya's style I do think is going to get him the Like win. Santos and Uzdemir had little successes when they were able to crash through the distance and land on Ankalaya, but Ankalaya, if you talk about defensive acumen with striking defense, he's not Islam Makachev because Makachev is normally taking you down so quickly yeah. you don't have time to hit him. But for Ankalaev, he is very, very defensively sound when he is on the feet. So you look at a matchup like this, to me, both guys have five round styles conducive to winning decisions. But for Ankalaev, it's the weight, the bait, and then the utilization of his distance strikes. And that's what I like out of him in this matchup. I so, think Yuri would be a difficult matchup for Ankalaev, though. Oh, yeah. So for me, I have Ankalaev. For you, you're going with Ankalaev. This should be a great fight. Though. Would you agree with me? Right now, I think the light heavyweight division's in kind of a revolving door pattern with the title. I don't look at anybody in the top 10 right now and think, wow, that fighter's going to hold the belt forever. Like, I'm really impressed by what Yuri Prohoshka's shown us. He's an entertaining fighter. He can dig deep when he has to dig deep. But a style like that normally doesn't defend the title 10 times in a row so just with the light heavyweight division i think it's really fun right now you've got a guy like jamal hill he's been able to make the rise i know rackage is out with his injury right now but he was a guy who showed a lot of promise on his way to the title i just think the division's in a fun state right now it might not be in its prime when it had forrest griffin and rampage and chuck liddell where everybody felt like they were pound for pound fighters not just 205 fighters but i feel like everybody in the top 10 is pretty close and it could be a fun time for the division and it is a big time card coming up this weekend you also have bellator 289 Stotts versus Sabatello. Those guys have bad blood. Carmouche versus Velasquez. Magomed Magomedov taking on Patchy Mix. A lot of great fights on that card. A lot of MMA to choose from. One championship was doing it on Prime Video. I don't know if you caught any of that, but your guy, your guy, the monkey god, Jared Brooks, picking up a giant win. I've been telling everybody for years. You don't know. You don't get it. There was a fighter who got cut by the UFC who beat Devison Figueredo. I don't care what the judges said. He beat Devison Figueredo. So shout out Jared Brooks. A lot of great fights. Make sure you check out Question Mark Kicks this Saturday. It's always two hours before the prelims. We get to see how the weigh-ins play out. We switch our pick from Phil Rowe to Nico Price. And it and didn't I, work. It did not work. But a lot of fun over there on that show. And of course, there's one card after this before the big break that they take uh, during the, the holidays. So a big time card with 282 from T-Mobile this weekend. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it.